A very good afternoon to one and all. I, Dr. Lima Das, co-organizing secretary, welcome you all to this dental webinar organized by the Regional Dental College and the Srimanta Concordia University of Health Sciences, Rohati. Uh, no. At the outset, I would like to welcome our distinguished guests and speakers, along with all the participants to this dental webinar in post-COVID times. I thank Honorable Vice Chancellor Ma'am, Professor Deepika Deka, for making this webinar possible under the university. Without any further delay, we would like to start the program with a welcome address by the organizing chairman of this webinar, Dr. A.C. Bhuya, sir. Dr. A.C. Bhuya is presently working as the principal and head of the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Regional Dental College, Guwahati. He also holds the prestigious post of the Dean, Faculty of Dental Sciences, and the Sri Mata Hakkadi University of Health Sciences, Government of Assam. He was also one of the past president of Federation of Operative Dentistry of India, and has also served three terms as a member of the Dental Council of India, including chairman of postgraduate studies. Dr. E. C. Kuya has also authored various chapters and textbooks in the speciality, along with numerous publications in reputed international and national journals. Sir, I request you to address our esteemed guests and participants of this webinar. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Li uh, Dr. Lima. Okay, Namaskar. Respected Vice Chancellor, Dr. Deepika Deka, Madam, Principal of the Regional College, we are. The first bearer of dental education in the Northeast. My esteemed speaker of the day, okay, okay namely uh, Padmasri Dr. Mahis Bharma, who is the uh, uh, current DC of Guru Gobind Singh. University New Delhi, my good friend Dr. O.P. Harvanda, ex director of Dental Center of AII MS New Delhi, my beloved student Dr. Dupi Krishna, director of the Root Canal Foundation, MI, and he is also the brain behind of holding that. International Federation of uh, 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 Endodontic uh, Association, Dr. Partha Sarathi Atabarti, who is our own student, who has done oncology training. And all the participants of this program, I welcome you all from the regional college of Bahati, who is organizing this prestigious, prestigious congregation under the ages of Sirimanta Shankardev Hills. University. Our dynamic VC, Madam, who is very keen in uh, organizing and creating excellent uh, academic atmosphere in the medical education in the state, has e e initiated this online lecture and the seminar. I, Dr. A.C. Bhuya, Dean of Faculty of Dental Sciences, Simanta Sankar Dev Health 
university have the proud privilege to welcome you all to the first ever online exercise on dentistry organized by the Srimatha Sankardev Health University. I thank you, madam, for guiding us in this venture. In this era of, of modern technolo technology, sharing of knowledge and experience using an online platform is the need of our. The year 2020 has been unprecedented year for every person across the globe. The coronavirus pandemic has pushed many of us to review how we and our academic teachings. This includes a shift from in-person meeting to the video call, uh, harnesses the power of video, video, video conferencing to impart teaching and expertise through online seminars. Thus, online education is the breakthrough, breakthrough model for the higher education that has enabled lifelong learning in today's increasingly, uh, increasingly networked world. It offers quality education that is highly personal, conducive, access, allowing for better interaction between the students and the professors as it brings all the students on the equal footing. Presently, most of the educational institution offers online access their students to help them continue their, their learning journey and we are too not an exception. Presently, today we have invited four eminent academician and the subject expert from the different corners of the of this country who will share their expertise in the different aspects of dentistry through this interactive online seminar session i hope all the participants including the undergrads post graduation students faculties from the different dental colleges of the state will definitely get a highly benefited and enrich their the, the, the knowledge. I wish the program a, 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 a grand success. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you, sir, for underlining the importance of online study. Uh, thank you very much. So this webinar would not have been possible without the encouragement and support of Professor Dr. Deepika Dekaman, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sri Mantra Concordate University. Dr. Deepika Deka pursued her MBBS and MD in obstetrics and gynecology from the Gohati Medical College and Hospital, Assam, and is the current Vice Chancellor of Sri Mantra Concordate University of Health Sciences. She was the director at Ames Kalyani, West Bengal, ex-chief of maternal fetal super speciality, and also ex-professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She has been awarded with WHO Fellowship at Georgetown University, USA in 1999, and the ICMR Senior Scientist Fellowship at King's George, at King's College and Hospital London in 2010. She has also done her observership at University of California and Ohio State University 
USA in 1993. Thank you, ma'am, for all your support. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor, ma'am, to inaugurate this webinar and speak a few words to the occasion. Thank you, Dr. Lima Das. A very good afternoon to everybody present here. First of all, I would like to congratulate Professor A.C. Bhuya and his very dynamic team, Dr. Chandanath and Lima Das and all his team members for organizing this webinar. I am very, very happy to see my old friends, Professor Mahesh Verma, who is at present in a very honorable position as the Vice Chancellor of the IP University. And also uh, I can see Professor Karbanda, who I have known for almost three decades at Ames as a colleague. And I'm also very happy to see that there are so many young uh, faculty who will be talking to all of you today. So I really congratulate and I welcome it's a great thing that the uh, department has organized this webinar. I think you know that ever since I took over as the vice chancellor about one and a half years back, uh, my whole idea of coming from Ames to here was that uh, I should improve the standards of the uh, all the uh, affiliated institutions, maybe to the level of Ames uh, Delhi, where I have worked for the last 37 years as a resident and then as a faculty. And I must say that I have been, I think, quite successful in that manner, in that aspect. And it really gives me pleasure that uh, to say that last year we had organized 12 uh, CMEs. I had uh, mainly started off with uh, how to do research, how to get funds for research, how to do international collaborations. And of course, after that, on how to publish a paper. Because if you do the research, and you don't publish, people will not know what research has been done and it cannot be used for the benefit of society. So along with research, which should be of course very relevant to this part of the country, I have always stressed that the research that we do here should be of issues which are of concern to us. I mean, it's, uh, we, uh, we know we are a developing state and uh, we are much behind the other states of India. So we really need to do research on the things which are of our day-to-day -day concern for our patients of this part of the country. And uh, along with the research, I have also taught people how to get the funds because the first thing they used to say is there are no funds. Then to, to uh, their surprise, they realized that actually there are so much funds which can be availed of from DBT, from DST, from ICMR. In fact, many of them have, you know, twin projects of which the Northeast states can actually get a lot of funding. Also, we have discussed a lot about how to get international funding. And today also, I again wish to stress, I'm so happy that there are 348 participants that you should do research because you are in an academic institution and uh, without research, the society will not progress further. We have realized how much it is necessary in these days of COVID. And today also the prime minister has visited the three centers all over the country in Ahmedabad, Pune, and Hyderabad on vaccines, you know, the COVID vaccine. So uh, right from the top, it has started that you need to do research, you need to do collaborations. So I take this platform again as an opportunity to tell the students and the younger faculty especially <clears throat> on how to go ahead with research. And we have important, very renowned researchers in our faculty today. So you will be learning from them. And of course, the other thing that I always talk about is that you should publish. Recently, we had the interviews for AIMS uh, uh, of Kohati. And uh, it was very depressing to know that uh, most of the people who are selected are from outside the state. That's because the number of publications and the number of research projects were comparatively lesser. And therefore, again, you know, to survive in your own state now, you will have to have more publications. As a professor, you need to have at least 10 publications in PubMed. 
international publications. So it, you know, we should really change our thoughts. We should give more importance to research and uh, publications. And it may seem that I'm repeating and repeating, but I really want to ingrain in the DNA of everybody present here, the students, that yes, this is a very important part of academics. So I'm very happy that the uh, RDC has organized this webinar and I welcome all the delegates and of course all the faculty are there. And I'm sure this same webinar is going to be very, very successful and very useful for you, for your daily life, for your practice and for your increase in the knowledge of your minds. Thank you very much, wish you all the best. Thank you, ma'am, for highlighting the importance of research and publications, and thank you for always being a source of inspiration for us. Thank you. So moving on. It is said that the beginning of every professional institution in a region requires a father figure, and for Regional Dental College, it is undoubtedly Dr. B. R. Sir, founder principal of Regional Dental College, Guwahati. Dr. B. R. Bhuya, did his MBBS from Assam Medical College de in 1963 and BDS from KGMC Lucknow in 1966. He obtained MDS qualification in periodontics in 1969 from KGMC and rejoined the Guwahati Medical College and served there in 1982. After completing postgraduate studies, Dr. Bhuya with fellow dentists of Northeast region formed the Assam State Branch of the Indian Dental Association in 1969. Thereafter, realizing the shortage of dental manpower in Northeast region, Dr. Bhuya established the Regional Dental College in 1983. He has published various scientific papers in both national and international journals and was awarded a fellowship by the International College of Dentists in 1983. I request, sir, to kindly speak a few words on this occasion. Honorable Passenger of Simon Tosun Kodaba University Health Sciences, Professor Dipika Deka, other participants of this program, from Delhi, Dr. Mohesh Varma, Kalbanda, etc. We welcome and thank all of you for participating in this program. I appreciate the decision of the principal and staff of the Regional Dental College for organizing the dental web near under the aegis of the Simon Tosun Kodeva University of Health Sciences. I learned dentistry about 60 years back with the help of food and gene. There was only one electrically run cutting instrument which was used only by the teachers. Like other systems of medicine, lot of technological development also already achieved in dentistry, which is which provided facility we arrived at this stage. Out of many digital devices, Obinier is one which is providing opportunity of learning without being physically present in the classroom, seminar, laboratory, etc. With the help of Obinier, Learners can learn and see a person talking and delivering lecture on relevant matters. The webinar is also being used to meet the academic needs of the learners, especially during the worldwide corona pandemic. The technological development is definitely helping teachers to teach learners through video, confer video conferences, which is providing opportunity for working from home from certain worker. Suddenly, the digital world is literally taken over our lives 
in a manner which was, was not visualized a year back. But a large percentage of our population is not competent to avail the benefit of technology. The present circumstances suggest mass movement to promote digital literacy. I would like to urge technological and educational institutions to play a leading role in achieving the desired results. Information is the main commodity in the present day knowledge society. Digitalization is the medium to access such information. The, un the untainted disruption caused by the Corona COVID-19 pandemic forced millions of students out of classrooms due to closure of the schools and colleges. And the whole community is trying to meet their challenge by adopting online education. However, access to such technological system depends on availability of infrastructure, access to the required tools like computer, smartphones, speed and availability of internet service, etc. However, the online education cannot be a substitute of the conventional system. It appears that the online system will have to be continued for long as the uncertainty of total control of the COVID-19 is evident. However, every technological development bears certain digital hazards also, which are of course negotiable. Experts on this line say that people are not aware of direct connection between the frequent use of electronic devices and sleep problems for children and adults develop. Many research studies have explored the connection between the electronic devices and mental health. And the results indicate that it leads to mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, mood disorders, and even sometimes suicidal tendencies. Electronic gadgets have a lot of advantages, but disadvantages are also there. It is perhaps a way advisable to keep ourselves consciously away from electric gadgets for a prolonged period unless it is an absolute necessary. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your ever inspiring words. And thank you for gracing this occasion today. We move on to our scientific session, but before that, I would like to inform our participants that a link to a feedback form will appear at the end of the session in the chat box. Kindly fill up that form to await the certificate of participation. We now start a scientific session with our first distinguished speaker, Dr. Mahesh Verma, Honorable Vice Chancellor. Guru Gobind Singh of the Prasad University, New Delhi. I would like to give a brief introduction of this esteemed personality. Professor Dr. Mahesh Verma is currently the Vice Chancellor of Guru Gobind Singh of the Prasad University, New Delhi. Previously, he has been the Dean of Maulana Azad Institute of Dental Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Verma is the President of International Association for Dental Research. India Division and past president of the Indian Dental Association head office, Indian Prosthodontic Society, International College of Dentists, Section 6, and Bear Hoshar Academy. He is an honorary advisor of Armed Forces Dental Services, Ministry of Defense, Government of India, and international advisor to Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, UK. Today, till date, he has received the following awards for his distinguished service to the profession. Dr. B.C. Roy Award by the President of India in 2007, Padma Shri by the President of India in 2014, 
In 2020, the President of India conferred the National Award on him for outstanding efforts in science and technology. He is also a proud recipient of Global Oral Health Progress Award, Germany, for rendering valuable services in furthering global oral health and the Elmer S. Best Memorial Award for outstanding contributions to the art and science of dentistry by the Pear Orchard Academy, USA. We thank you wholeheartedly for accepting our invitation as speaker for this webinar and request you to kindly begin the presentation titled, Hello You, Leadership and Creativity Are Intertwined. So you can kindly share the screen. And if anyone has any queries during the presentation, you can write to us in the chat box. Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Deepika Deka, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Srimanta Sankara Deva University of Health Sciences. Professor B. R. Bhuyan, Doyen of Dentistry of North of Northeast India. My dear friend, Professor Atul Bhuyan, all the faculty members of Regional Dental College, participants, delegates, uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be part of uh, this unique uh, webinar, uh, which is covering different areas of dentistry and uh, involving me. First of all, I wish to congratulate the great duo uh, Professor Deepika Deka and uh, Professor Atul Bhuyan for uh, all the changes uh, which is being being brought out as uh, Professor Deka just now highlighted uh, what change she is intending to do, what changes she has done in the last uh, year or so in terms of academics, research, uh, teaching, training, and uh, my uh, best wishes to both of them for uh, all their endeavors. I wish to share with you that uh, uh, regarding this webinar, my dear friend uh, Atul, whom I call Otul, because we have, uh, we have uh, studied together, lived together, uh, we are close buddies. So if I'm allowed to say that, and uh, he just called me one of these days and he said there is a webinar being planned and uh, I go to be one of the speakers and I, you know, I readily agreed. And, uh, but he told me that, give me your topic. And, uh, you know, I said, okay. And then you, you know, as, as usually it happens that you, you know, you forget about it. Then one fine day, he gave me a pressing call and he said that I need your communication, topic of your communication. And the way, you know, the moment he said about communication, my antennas went up. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it, you know, reminded me of a book which was given to me by somebody during the lockdown period called Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, a very bestseller book. And there's another book by the same author called Homo Dios. And, uh, in, you know, that uh, book I read, uh, part of it, and, you know, it said that the most effective communication is through storytelling. And, uh, you know, because storytelling uh, involves a basic string which binds all, all beliefs, all theories. So I would like to start with a story. And, uh, you know, story is, uh, you know, how do we start a story? You start a story with once upon a time. And uh, so once upon a time, uh, there was a deadly bug uh, which took over the human civilization. And uh, we don't know where it came from. Of course, we know where it originated. And there are many theories. You know, the scientists said it's a mother, it's a vengeance of a mother nature. Uh, the Godman said, uh, Godman, uh, Godman said that uh, it is a fury of the gods. 
and uh, some of the politicians they said it's a it's one of the biological warfare but uh, you know but uh, it just came it just happened and we never imagined that uh, it could shake the world it could it would really overtook overtook the entire civilization and uh, it was a real threat uh, you know the entire cities were locked down all the offices schools business houses you know whether it was wedding or funerals or birthdays or parties you know everything became solo everything became isolated everything was socially distant and became a hush hush quiet affair and uh, you know unfortunately many died uh, many died and some especially for us who are in a healthcare business we lost many of our colleagues many of our worthy doctor friends and uh, in fact the worst part of it is is that uh, you think this story is familiar was it once upon a time or it is currently happening you know we all live through it and we still going through you know this story sounds very familiar and uh, we know what i am referring to so why are we talking about uh, about uh, uh, you know leadership and creativity today what relevance it has in today's time you know uh, uh, you know we all uh, we all hiding ourselves uh, in a, in a safety homes in safety trying to isolate ourselves and the entire world is going through doomsday why are we talking about leadership and creativity today and uh, we all know that uh, corona is our enemy we should rather be talking about corona because uh, uh, you know because uh, that is the enemy Uh, we should be targeting or targeting about so we know that corona is an enemy but that enemy is not alone uh, you know because uh, corona is uh, only a part of the problem we have other issues like economic recession i'm sure you must have uh, uh, seen today's paper that uh, our gdp has been contracted uh, contracted to minus 7.5% a couple of months back it was Twelve minus twenty three point nine percent. So we have rather improved, but we're still in red. So and not only that, uh, we have pollution all around, especially in big metros like Delhi, which is worsening the situation. And uh, we all the time uh, worried about our jobs, and uh, there is so much of a stress around, all around. And uh, so what? What are we giving this name to this feeling? Uh, you know we are all paranoid about you know ambiguity things which are very complex things which are volatile uncertain you know and we know that there is no despite in the near future unless we have some uh, you know some uh, sure shot uh, treatment for it so there's a lot of fear and in anxiety you know all around so it's time to wake up i think it's time to wake up because uh, you know we have taken it easy for too long and uh, we have taken sometimes we have taken shortcuts and i think what we need today is a need a hard reset it's like uh, you know uh, you have a clock you have an alarm and you reset your alarm that okay now i i got to i got to get up and uh, you know start acting so we we need to reset our system very hardly and we have to find the answer to all the all these things ourselves uh uh you know it is said that no one can save us if anybody who can save us it is only we ourselves because we are faced with it we have been affected by it and we got to solve it ourselves only we can do it so we better grab the life by the horns and chart our own course about it so uh, so we have to be leaders you know in our own way isn't it we usually think uh, a leader is somebody who is at a pedestal who is bigger and better who is very powerful and uh, uh, but i i you know don't you think that 
uh, it is not leader is not something who sit in a high horse leader is someone who is like me and you and everybody who is on the ground and fighting the war like any common man and uh, we are all leaders in our own right you know as uh, educators as practitioners you know doctors dental surgeons you know as trainers as students as citizens in families we have uh, you know we we are like as fathers as mothers as siblings as friends i, th I think we are all as a citizen community we are all leaders uh, in our in our own way and uh, what are the those three t's which are in trouble today you know i i I'm, uh, this was raised by dr b r buyan also little bit mentioned by dr atul buyan and dika madam that three t's which are in trouble today are teaching training and treating and uh, what is the fundamental what is the fourth t which is the foundation and fundamental of all this is teeth the fourth t isn't it so everything is impacted especially for all of us who are in an education business, business these days so the question is that how would i have handled it if uh, uh, you know what would i have had done it differently if i had to start from a scratch you know uh, like a student can say that if i had to prepare a lecture or i had to uh, do a course or i have to do a session how, how i would have done it differently i think the need of the hour is that we need to be need to dip, uh, need to think different need to think out of the box isn't it you know the need is the need is the need of the hour is let us think unconventional let us not think run of the mill rather be thinking out of the box uh you know as educators we understand leadership very well you know because uh, uh, you know our real achievements are in our students isn't it so let's see this video So you know, as a teacher, don't you think when your students do well, you know, you feel proud? You know, usually all of us in universities or educational institutions, you know, we talk about an alumni, uh, your students who have done well. In fact, in many assessments, they ask you, which is your best alumni? Which are which are your best alumni? How are they doing? Isn't it? We feel proud. So I think as a as an education uh, leader in education business, I think we need to encourage. We need to foster. and we need to nourish our students so who is a leader you know the question is the burning question is who is a leader is he someone who is you know what is he how does he look like how does he behave is it something different than a, you know a commoner you know who is it you know you know as you all know the leader is nobody leader is like any of us who is chasing Uh, the the opportunities all the time isn't it and if you look around there are opportunities all around us you know i always say there's a galore of opportunities uh, all the time all around us but the only thing we got to do is look hard enough all the time we got to look hard enough and look hard for those opportunities and uh, i think looking hard uh, is not only uh, uh, only important it's also important that we uh you know we look different you know we think different think unconventional think uh, out of the box because uh, you know i'm sure you've heard of a statement where it is said that work smart and not hard so just look, looking hard is not at all
want to think I think there's a technical glitch. We will wait for uh, Dr. Manish Kudin, sir, to be back. I think he has exited. So we'll wait for this. has been a very interesting presentation on these COVID times and how leadership, how everybody should take responsibility to take care of the current situation and how we all together can improve the healthcare system. Uh, there has been a problem, there has been a glitch. So we hope we can have Dr. Manish Verma back with us. <clears throat> Kindly bear with us, all participants. Yes, he is back. Uh, we had a glitch, but now we're back to have Dr. Vikram Sharma with us. Over to you, sir. Yes, sir. We are glad to have you back. There was a. Okay. There was a are you? Uh, I'm audible. Yes, sir, you are the Yeah, so, you know, this is uh, other part of the technology glitches, you know, technology also uh, is a great boon, but at the same time, it has a lot of limitations. So I was talking about leader and uh, especially, uh, you know, because leader has to unify his team and I he has to also ensure that everybody is on the same board. So let's look at hockey coach and how he builds his team. So there are, there are many lessons to be learned, but you know, the most important lesson is that a leader has to ensure that all his teammates and the teammates may have a different positions, but they all have to be brought on the same, uh, you know, same fold, same, uh, same uh, board and uh, have to ensure that they all achieve the same goal. Now, the next thing is, so, uh, so you know, who is a leader? Uh, you know, it said the leader is Hindu. You know, it reminds me of the Doha by Kabir. Jab main tha tab hari nahi. Jab hari hai, hai nahi. It means that when my ego was there, the God was absent. When God was there, then I was missing. I was there. And sab adhyara miti gaya, jab dekhya mahi. That means, you know, that light which came within me, that, you know, that that inner light when came, all that confusion, all that puzzle, in, you know, of uh, ego, everything went away. So it's all within you, you know? And a teacher, uh, you know, has to be always the outgoing extrovert, 
uh, you know, he uh, he's sharing his experiences, not keeping it under his chest. The another thing is, you know, he has to utilize his experience. You know, back experience, gain experience, future endeavors to be said, sincerity because sincerity and integrity, nothing happens. And the most uh, important part is that his leader need not be rigid. Uh, uh, you know, the leader has to be, ideal leader has to be flexible. Uh, uh, the, he has to mend, he has to adapt himself as per the need and as per the situation. Uh, uh, somebody may ask me, uh, is manager a leader? Uh, what is the difference between uh, uh, difference between a manager and a leader? You see, the manager uh, is manager can be replaced. You know, it is said that uh, uh, you know the managers only managers because you know uh, in, and but but the leader cannot be replaced. When leader goes away or when the leader surrenders, you know everything uh, is likely to fall down. So. So, you know, I want to tell you, I'm not bragging about myself. I'm no leader. But uh, when I was uh, heading, uh, I was, a, you know, supposed to be a boss and people used to come to me, you're a boss, but sir, you're more than a boss. You know, I, I never understood what they meant. But later on, I felt they probably, they considered me as their mentor, their friend, their confidant. And, uh, you know, for us, those, uh, those of us uh, who are, we are all in a, uh, education business. So I think we got to foster that bond of that mentorship, leadership with our students. And, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, you can see a hive of a bees here. And when the queen bee, queen bee dies, you know, they choose another queen bee because they choose a leader. And unfortunately, if uh, there is a time lag between choosing a queen bee, then what happens? The entire bee hive gets destroyed. So it's also similar in a chess game. When a pawn, knight, and rook, they all can be replaced. But when the king is captured, our army, you know, gets lost. So is a leader different from a manager? As I just said, manager only manages. He has subordinates. He only stabilizes. Whereas the leader, he leads. And he has the followers. And he improves. He doesn't just maintain, but he all the time trying to improve the things, as our honorable VC is doing, that She's trying to generate funds from different sources, trying to push research, push publication. And that is how the leader life. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you would agree that we have a, a great leader, a leader uh, in our, in our uh, uh, prime minister, uh, Modi Saab. You know, the leaders have followers. I think he, if you look at the social media, he has a tremendous fan following. In, in millions are on the social uh, social media following him. He has a vision, vision digital. You know, he has a he, he had a digital India. That's a vision for him. Leaders set direction. He's always futuristic, thinking about uh, you know future times. He's transformational. You know, all the time wanting India to be a pedestal in the world, and he's taking risk. You know, did he take a risk in demonetization and some of these things? He was uh, initially. Uh, you know, even, um, you know, when we had, uh, uh, what is that called, when we uh, went to another country and, uh, uh, you know, we uh, tried to hit the uh, terrorist camp, I know it's all uh, very controversial, we shouldn't be talking about that, but he did take risks and he broke, he, he let us break the rules. He, you know, you remember that when he came to power, almost 800 old, you know, laws, you know, ancient laws were all all thrown to the wind, and he always find new ways. Leaders always find new ways, and uh, I'm sure you agree that he has a 360 degree, uh, you know, communication on a digital platform. He has a monkey bath, all those programs. So you know how a leader connects, uh, you know, with his team. But uh, when it comes to uh, comes to institution or a dental college, you know, other situation is slightly different. We have a professor who gives the direction, the assistant professor who walks, and the demonstrator and lecturer, uh, he walks briskly, but it's ultimately the brunt is on a student who flies, who runs around, you know, who cries and ultimately gets, uh, ultimately gets burnt, you know, sometimes, not always. So, you know, uh, you see, uh, the objective is the, that vision which 
academic department or professor has must percolate it uh, to the last level to the last person you know look at the inverted uh, uh, you know power structure uh, in a cube uh, here you see that uh, the director or the principal is at the at the base of the cube and uh, the department of staff uh, are at the at the apex and uh, they are the other ones you know who have who have to make day to day decisions and are least involved sometimes in decision making so so uh, you know so the the biggest uh, but, but for a leader it, it is always needed that whatever vision he has it must uh, reach the decision making must reach to the last person uh, last person uh, in the in the in the row and uh, there are many leadership styles you know there are many leadership styles and these leadership styles are based upon on a type of communication you have with your teammates or with your group and there are many there are so many types of leadership and basically uh, it all depends on how you uh, you know how you treat your teams and how you motivate them how you communicate with them and uh, you know look at this uh, uh, leadership style participative leaders uh, uh, you must have seen that recently uh, kamla harris uh, of indian origin she ran for us vice presidentship and uh, you know when they won she called up joe biden and uh, she said hey joe uh, you know we have done it and uh, you are the new uh, new president of united states so you know uh, uh, when she said that it made all the followers all the uh, all the um, you know all the uh, party workers very happy and you know the basic objective was to to bring everybody all together so participatory leaders are well appreciated you know they they are very uh, very friendly open they believe in conversation and share information they encourage uh, sharing of ideas they communicate very well and there's another leader style uh, which is equally very effective in fact they can make a profound influence uh, in the community is a servant leaders you know which is like our perfect example is mother teresa who they they less speak less but allows others to speak listen more they empathize and uh, you know the base of their humanitarian work they build the communities and uh, then team is everything so this is a servant leadership and uh, this is again uh, something which is uh, uh, you know which is very uh, very well appreciated uh, i remember the statement made by henry ford Uh, who said that you know who is a perfect example of servant leadership he said you can take my factories burn my buildings but give me my people and i'll build the business right back again because for him the most important thing are his teammates his uh, are uh, his uh, his people so uh, you know we are in education business as i said so for us uh, you know i think uh, uh, it's not just leadership i think it's also very important that uh, in addition to being leader we also very creative because i think leadership and creativity are uh, interwoven together it's like a telescopic crown you remember telescopic crown when you have a thimble and over that you have a crown so it's all woven together and uh, it cannot be separated so you know it's uh, they said that creativity and leadership go hand in hand uh, you know it cannot be separated it said that you know if you are a leader and you want to stay leader you have to be creative and uh, vice versa also that if you are creative and want to stay creative you got to be a leader so it has to all the time go hand in hand and if you look at uh, this link leadership and creativity and i have lined up some of the some of the great leaders from different areas uh kiran majumdar saab desachi uh, rahman our abdul kalam ji sarojini naidu rabindranath tagore pt usha uh you know uh, chopra priyanka chopra vikas khan they all leaders in their own ways but they have used their creativity and leadership i i always feel so leadership is a catalyst which can speed up the reaction but the creativity is, is a reaction itself because if you don't have that process you know you cannot move faster so you need uh, these things together and uh, all the leaders you know they they usually use creativity as one of the uh, one of the ways to move forward 
So uh, I will give you one example of creative leadership in a fast food. I'm sure some of you must have seen uh, this video where uh, uh, Mr. Venkatesh Iyer, uh, a South Indian Brahmin, in how he has established uh, Goli Vada Pao and how he uh, came about about uh, thinking about uh, this. lost it again. The screen is not sharing anything. Yes. So, so, you know, let's have mantras that how to become a creative leader. I think no one can teach you how to become one. But I think uh, something which is very important is that uh, we start uh, from within, uh, start uh, uh, observing things, start understanding things, and uh, you know, introspection of uh, things uh, because you know it's all it's all within you, and that's very important to develop a vision. And uh, uh, vision, what is vision? Vision, uh, uh, you know, we all the time we want to to do things for environment, for disease control, awareness, and education. So, you know, how, what do we do it? Uh, I think we need to form uh, a vision which is uh, engaging your heart and spirit. That means which is very close to you. And uh, it leads you. you know, it incites you. It, uh, it excites you to take effort. You're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. Uh, you must feel uh, fulfilled that you have been able to do it. It, it, it has to be simple and it has to be attainable. If you just make a cast head, it doesn't work and it can change. You know, it's not that vision cannot change. You, you can change the vision as you go ahead. So how to become a creative leader? You know, creative leader, uh, you know, you, we start with what is available with you. You know, don't wait for a for a something ideal. You know, we, in, usually in England, are you waiting for a Christmas? You're not waiting for a situation, ideals. Whatever you have, just join the dots and make a beginning. Uh, you see, uh, 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 sometimes imperfections can be your asset, you know, because if you're intelligent, you can use uh, imperfections to best of your advantage. Look at, look at this video.
then next mantra is how to become a creative leader. I think uh, if you want to involve creativity in your leadership, I think you've got to always think different. Think laterally. Uh, dissociate from run-of-the-mill ideas. You know, it said that run-of-the-mill will only give you one plus one to two. But when you think literally, it may give you one plus one may make 11. You know, if you look at this picture, uh, when you, there's a linear thinking, you have only one solution. But when you think laterally, it might get you multiple, uh, multiple solutions of the same problem. And then um, later thinking is also giving expression to your experiences. Why can't a building like, a, you know, uh, we have this uh, Lotus Baha'i temple in Delhi. Uh, why can't, uh, you know, why can't a building uh, look like uh, a flower? So someone has given uh, expression to their experiences. So later thinking will always give you uh, ideas and uh, things which have not been tried before. Number four, how to become a creative leader is use your experience from different aspects of your life. You know, I again uh, want to tell you that, uh, uh, you know, today is a time of interdisciplinary thinking. We always some, learn something, apply somewhere else. You know, I, I again don't want to brag about myself that I did my MBA about, you know, 15, 16 years back. And I'm using that uh, education today for uh, the university setup. And I use part of it in building the dental college. So dentistry, of course, has been my core area, but uh, I think my experiences, uh, you know, in different areas have helped me. So similarly, each one of you have so many experiences and please pursue your interest in writing, teaching, communication. I think all these, which is other than your core area, will always come to help you to, you know, to become a creative leader. And a creative leader always think at a larger picture because bigger picture is more important. You know, he thinks far. He doesn't have a tunnel vision. He, he's not myopic. He, does, he doesn't think very close. And he considers all, all possibilities and always think big because unless you think big, you cannot become big. You know, the next mantra is, is that, you know, many a times the fear of failures that hold us back. They do not allow us. Uh, that's our biggest enemy. They do not allow us to try things. You know, most of the situation in life are not do or die. They are do or try because things is, is something you do. It will not be the doomsday. You know, you must try things. And yes, failures are part of success. And we must all, all the time, uh, uh, not be afraid of our failures. Failure teaches you so many things. The next mantra is to become a creative leader is not just keeping creative to yourself. I think creativity has to percolate to every member of your team. I'm sure each one of you have seen this Dai Handi uh, during Janmashtami where uh, all these uh, boys, they make a human chain to make a human pyramid and one person slips, the entire structure uh, comes tumbling down. So I think each member of the team has to be actively engaged and uh, the creativity is not just restricted to you, it has to be everybody in your team member. And uh, a creative leader always in, encourages diversity, you know, all the time, uh, isn't it? It's like a food tali. You know, we enjoy mita, khatta, namkeen, all bland. You know, I'm very, uh, very, I'm a foodie, big foodie. And Atul has uh, given me so many times the opportunity to enjoy ahamiya thali, asami thali, saak bhaji, pitika, kol full, ha, johar rice, all uh, jhol, all part of a, you know, the parampara thali I have enjoyed. So our leader also, he encourages diversity and all these things put, put together becomes, uh, becomes the best, uh, uh, best uh, uh, example or best success, leads to success. And a creative leader also uh, understand strength and limitation. I think strength and weakness are, uh, are both are very important, but the leader will exploit the strength and undermine and limit the limitation, you know, he, he will minimize the limitation or weaknesses and exploit the strength. A uh, creative leader uh, builds a team because your team is your cushion. You know, it's the team which uh, puts you on air and, and uh, catches you back. But if your team is not there, you will fall like a thud and uh, end up with, uh, you know, with, with injuries. So it's the team which is the cushion. And so every member of the team has to be contributing uh, you know they have to be uh, they have to be putting the effort together and everybody cannot be equal they would be different uh, you know find your own style the biggest answer is 
that you are not you you don't be a copycat somebody is doing it and you want to do it uh, you also want to do that way i think you have so, you know nurture your own style create your own style you can be a creative who leads uh, authoritatively just like our uh, abdul kalam ji or you can be authority but you can be creative and you lead by example uh, food for thought L look at these two uh, business uh, magnates here we had our own ambani's which is a family business they maintained it they didn't change but they diversified so they maintain and diversified and on the other side we have sundar pichai who was uh, you know making algorithms for the mail gmails and ultimately he disrupted the entire silicon valley and he he became a ceo of alphabet so he disrupted and diversified on the other side there's a leader who maintained and uh, and uh, diversified you know i think today uh, what is really needed is education uh, uh, education but education with a creative leadership you know we have gone through all that we have suffered we have evolved we have coped i think uh, dr bohian was also saying that you know all the digital uh, uh, platform which uh, all these year all these months we have gone through it it created lot of stress also in all the all that uh, rackage i if i am allowed to say the pandemic created but uh, we also learned that uh, uh, there were uh, many challenges uh, there was a uh, you know there was a gaping uh, divide digital divide you know some of us still have do not have uh, connectivity do not have reach uh, there were shortened uh, attention spans there was a problem with active gaming session aside assignments and examination but you know as as a, as a leader i think uh, we go to pruners you know what i am chasing the dreams developing making ways uh, building things these are the pruners and you know we 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 got to blend all those attributes uh, in our field and we become are the pruners now they look at this teacher how she Uh, solving the problems on a blackboard and she is beaming it through her uh, uh, through uh, through her uh, uh, phone which has been made a makeshift camera so something we all the all the time we we need to be creative and, and the communication has to be on and we have to learn upgrade technology learn technology some of us who are not very familiar with technology i think it's high time we also get familiarized and we just don't have to be educators we have to be mentors and uh, no we, we don't want to talk about china and we chatting things about china but i and the other uh, <coughs> director represents opportunity so there is an opportunity uh, in the crisis itself you know it it, it was that there is a opportunity in the crisis itself so i think we got to rise Uh, to the occasion and display our best quality you know we all have limitation we all i have barriers we all have boundaries but at the yet at the same time you know we got to come out come out of it and uh, uh, and in uh, you know, a show and nurture our own leadership style uh, i would just like to uh, end up my presentation uh, by uh, you know asking you uh, you know by exhorting you that uh, you know <clears throat> leadership starts taking an initiative you see each one of us all the time we making complaints you know this is not there that is not there but there are very few people you know who get up and uh, make it happen uh, make an effort to change and i'm sure uh, you know as i said the leadership dr buyan dr dika you know they how they are making an effort making effort. this video which is uh, which is my last part of my presentation i have seen it hundreds of time and every time i see it you know i get goosebumps you know i start literally crying so you know in this video shows that how a small initiative uh,
So are you ready to, are you ready? All set to go? Thank you. I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Atul Bhuyan, uh, Dr. Deepika Deka, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, SSU HS, and all the organizing committee, all the heads of the department, Lima Das, Chandana Kalita, Mithali Bora, my colleague uh, uh, in Dental Council of India, Dr. Dilip Goswami, Jogeshwar Barman, colleague in Prosto, and Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your you. wonderful, informative session on creativity and leadership. I'm sure we'll gain a lot from here. And please extend, we extend our gratitude with this uh, virtual token of appreciation. Thank you so much. Our next distinguished speaker is Dr. O.P. Khaganda. I would like to briefly introduce this eminent personality to our viewers. <clears throat> Dr. O.P. Karbanda did his MDS in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics from KGMC Lucknow. He is an elf at the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh and did his Master of Medicine from Dundee and Federal <clears throat> Dental Surgery from Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh. He was formerly chief of the Center for Dental Education Research and is professor and head division of orthodontics and dental facial deformities, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is also the director of WHO Collaborating Center and chief KLV Center for Medical Education Technology and Innovation. <clears throat> I now request Sir to kindly enlighten us with his presentation on orthodontics from early childhood to adulthood. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I wish to say here that uh, this initiative by the <coughs> Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Deepika Dekha, is very nice. And it is also nice that I could meet her virtually uh, on this digital platform. And of course, missed her physical presence since a month in the campus in Ames. So, uh, but this opportunity has given me to see her. Um, at the outset, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Bhunya, who is the brain behind this, and uh, and also when I got a call from Dr. Nitali, I asked her that what you want me to speak, and because this is what would be the main conversation, and then you would like me to speak. So we agreed to the date, but we did not agree to the topic. And then when she called me again, I said, I can speak on a variety of things, but uh, what will be your preference? And then she was a little bit more or less not sure. She said, uh, then I asked her, who are the target audience for me? Because I had to create a lecture for my target audience. And then she said, they will be our general dentists, most of them, some faculty members. And I said, what as an orthodontist I can teach them. And then she says, maybe an overview. I said, then let me start with orthodontics from early childhood or even from birth till adulthood. And maybe I can share with them what I have done in the last four decades. And that is what I'm going to do that. If you permit, I will share my screen. Yes, sir. Uh, I have been doing orthodontics uh, in a public healthcare setup. And in this setup, we have different kind of challenges, uh, which are in contrast to challenges which you see in, uh, in a private clinic. These challenges are not only in terms of numbers, but they are also in terms of complexity. Uh, this is just to let you know that now I work as CG Pandit National Chair after I super elevated as the chief of the dental center at Ames. And for example, I just wish to show you here that uh, and we were looking at our data of CLEF last year. And, uh, and since the time we inaugurated our new clinic, uh, we had a huge increase in the number of CLEF patients. Uh, I have been practicing CLEF orthodontics since 1984, but there has been a set upsurge as we created an additional facility. Uh, in the joint clinic. We do get uh, 
patients with the situations which are look different. Uh, for example, this adult case has come to us uh, with 100% deep bite. And surprisingly, his periodontal condition was not that bad. But of course, there is a danger to the survival of the lower incisors. Now, with this low FMA, which is we call it a skeletal deep bite, uh, the challenge to treat this case is quite huge, quite huge. This young girl uh, who came to me from some city in Punjab doesn't seem to have any malocclusion. She looks good. Her occlusion also is reasonably okay. Her skeletal profile are most class one. But when you look a little bit more carefully on the nasopharyngeal space, you will see that her air space is very narrow. And it is so narrow that she is a case of obstructive sleep apnea. And she was referred to me by someone. She had been to different people, different people. And then she ended up with me. And I realized that although her profile is normal, her occlusion is normal, but she needs to be helped for the obstructive sleep apnea. This young lady, uh, who is herself a intern now, medical intern, has been under orthodontic treatment with three different orthodontists in two cities. Um, including she had an implant, she had all kind of treatment. And after having been frustrated for so long, she ended up with me seeking help that what can I do about her? And then I realized that although she's being treated for her dental malocclusion, her problem is the skeletal because she has a skeletal class two and not just dental malocclusion. And while undergoing this treatment, she even developed temporomandibular joint dysfunction syndrome. As you can see, her TMJs are showing signs of articular degeneration. And this, another this case, uh, who came to me from my hometown, actually, Mudafanagar, where I was born, uh, has undergone um, surgery for TMJ and kylosis on both the sides. But his mother is always crying, and she is crying because he does not let anybody sleep in the home. Not because that he doesn't look very nice, but simply because he snorts so loudly, because his retrognathic mandible has caused a lot of compression on his airway, and consequently he has become a case of obstructive sleep apnea. This lady, again, come from Haryana to me, and she is not a case of malocclusion. She is a case of created malocclusion by a surgeon who tried to fix a class three malocclusion by doing multiple surgeries on her jaws. And when you look at the, these x-rays, you will realize that she has undergone um, orthognathic surgery in the mandible. Uh, she has developed a facial asymmetry, as you can see on the extreme right PSF. And if you look at her CBCT, CBCT, you will realize that uh, how bad the, the occlusion has been created by uh, having improper orthognathic surgery and not combining with orthodontics. So when the surgeon tries to work alone without integrating with orthodontics, sometimes the result could be disastrous. And for us to treat her is, is a challenge because we have to undo what has been done before. And it is not something undoing just on the teeth, but on the entire maxillofacial complex. And we do get patients with syndromes who have hypoplastic maxilla and bulging eyes. And we have to treat their malocclusion uh, to make them live uh, respectfully in the society and develop their better functions. So let us learn as we walk. Uh, we took every challenge of this as an opportunity. Uh, and we found that early treatment gave significant benefits. Precise diagnosis is important. Uh, we need to use our indigenous data and products. We use to maximize and encourage. We need to collaborate. And we need to share the rewards. And that is what Dr. Verma just now said, that the leadership is all about sharing and caring. And I appreciate his lecture, which was uh, done in the very, very good manner. And he, in fact, has motivated us to be better persons. Now, this young boy uh, who has a functional shift, what is called functional lateral shift, because of the anterior cross bite, if left untreated, would become a permanent facial asymmetry. 
And this is a situation which could be treated with the first needs to diagnose if there is a functional shift because, and this shift would be diagnosed that when you ask the child to open the mouth and in open mouth, he doesn't have a malocclusion because the moment he makes into occlusion, that leads to, to a functional shift on the left side. Mixed dentition, <coughs> then that is the severity of lateral functional shift. You can see that the midlines are not coinciding in occlusion. But when they are not in occlusion, the midlines don't coincide. They do coincide, as you can see here. In the first contact, they coincide. And in occlusion, they don't coincide. And for also to diagnose, you need to take a PSF both in sometimes in centric occlusion and on first contact to know the amount of shift that occurs. So what you need, you need a simple appliance, simple appliance, but we now call it Tarwaski UBO activator, which means this is a device, two pieces of plastic for the upper and the lower jaw, which are united by a wire, which allows the mandible to be kept in its place where it should be, where it should be. And in few months time, the asymmetry becomes, facial asymmetry is improved, the face becomes symmetrical, cross bite is corrected. And as you can see on the PSFlogram, the midlines are matching. So that is the beauty of early diagnosis and early treatment. And here this young boy whom I met in a party actually, uh, in a social function, and I saw the grandson of one of our uh, learned colleagues, and he seems to have an um, early uh, cross bite developing class three at a young age of uh, four years. And then this obviously required some kind of an maxillary expansion because he has a deficient maxilla. We had to do rapid maxillary expansion. We had to protect his upper jaw. Uh, as you can see in with RME, the maxilla is split into two parts. And, and he's in three months time, uh, his cross bite is corrected, his maxilla is expanded. But when you expand a maxilla with rapid maxillary expansion, you get into posterior open bite, which you see here. And this open bite eventually gets corrected with the eruption of permanent teeth. And that is what this chart is trying to show that there is a fine line between a functional examination and COCR shift. And if it is a true class three malocclusion, um, you treat to need it differently than with a pseudo occlusion or a occlusion with functional shift. An orthodontist should be, or dentist rather, I would say, because the patient will first come to the dentist, should be able to recognize this. And this is the kind of clinical skill which perhaps every dentist should have uh, to be able to differentiate between a case of functional shift and a non-functional shift. So another child here uh, who came to us uh, with a complaint that his left side incisor has come, right side incisor has not come. There is only a bulge in the in the maxilla on the right side. And when we take a CBCT, we realize that he has a, a impacted tooth that is fine, but this impacted tooth is lying horizontal, anterior posteriorly, sagittally. And his, uh, his root has uh, to crown is at almost 90 degree, as you can see this, see this. So on slides number 23, 24, and 25, when we go into deeper sagittal uh, proper sections on MPR views, we realize that uh, it, is, it is a case with very, very poor prognosis. But nevertheless, the technique which I developed using the nickel titanium springs, uh, which I advocated since 19 and also published in my own book as well, um, we try to uh, go with those steps. But then the first step, what is called the the welcome preparation. We prepare the teeth with a full bonded and with a rigid arch wire with a hook here. And then uh, two nickel titanium springs, 100 grams. Uh, this one is not activated, but the one on the lingual side is activated because we want to create a, a system of uh, rotation. And as the teeth tooth sides are rotated and extruded, as you can see over the time, uh, as soon as it, it comes into the oral cavity, we could bond it, we could align it with the orthodontic treatment, and that is the occlusion two years on follow-up. So, so the timely intervention, accurate diagnosis. Um, I wish I would have intervened in this patient even much earlier before he came to me, uh, but even when he came to me, it was fine with me to, to treat him 
And the best support which I received in this case was, for example, accurate diagnosis using 3D imaging of convinced CT. This young girl uh, who had a significant protrusion, uh, very shy of herself. Uh, uh, and then when I used a appliance, which I learned um, in 90s when I went to Dundee to do medical education actually uh, with Dr. William Clark, um, I only used it to develop her lower jaw forward, align her maxilla, uh, use fixed appliance to align the teeth. And this is what I did actually in 1990, I had gone to Dundee to learn medical education. And those were the days when there was no internet and there were no mobile phones, only landlines. So I took a, I looked for him. He lived in a village called uh, Kirkordi in five district uh, of uh, Scotland. And I was able to catch him, learn from him. And that was an additional benefit to me of going to Dundee um, beside learning the, uh, learning the, the medical education part of professionalism. And you would not, you will be surprised that I still retain the, the ticket which I purchased by bus from Seagate. Uh, this is the direction which he gave me on phone to reach him. And then subsequently I attended his course in Manchester. And this is the appliance which I brought back to India. Uh, we researched, we used, and that changed the entire um, flavor of uh, orthodontics in the country in terms of early treatment. Uh, non-extraction treatment and and I, I published quite a bit on this this so the, this is some of the publications uh, which we researched on this appliance which you can see that um, it is just not all but only few of them and this particular device and then helped me to treat thousands of patients in AIMS because I could benefit all those people who could not afford fixed orthodontics I could diagnose early and we could implement this as a protocol uh, at AIMS, which is now called um, AIMS Twin Dog Protocol for the Functional Appliance. And this young boy, who you can see, has an incompetent lip, is a mouth breather, is a severe class two, uh, could be made to uh, look with the non extraction treatment uh, like this. And this is the pre treatment occlusion, as you can see in 2007. And that is the follow up during 2013, the occlusion and the outcome. And on cephalogram, as you would see that he had a severe proclination of the maxilla incisor, retrognathic mandible, uh, which is held back. Uh, this is the after the first phase, which is the trip block appliance, bringing the mandible forward. And then at this stage, um, aligning the upper and lower teeth with fixed appliance. Another girl, uh, her, I still can't forget this girl, Nani, because she was a very pleasing girl to talk to, but she is a vertical grower. That means her uh, mandible and maxilla are not growing at the same pace, uh, not in the direction which is downward and forward. Rather, the maxilla is growing like a concord upward and the mandible is growing downward, downward and backward. That means she's a vertical grower. And most functional appliances don't work in vertical growers. However, you can modify this appliance to work in a vertical grower. And I will show you how, how, what we did in this case. Uh, uh, and and you can see the outcome. So immediately on fun post functional appliance therapy, the benefits are not just aesthetics. The post functional appliance improves the mode of respiration. The respiration changes from mouth to the nose, and as the respiration changes from mouth to the nose, lip, lip competency comes back. And when the lip closer occurs, the maxilla starts growing in transverse direction. And as the maxilla grows in transverse direction, it grows in width, the entire facial development takes place. So there are some studies who, who say that if the functional appliance does not give actual growth of the mandible, but perhaps they are measuring that on cephalogram, unknowing that when the functional appliance works, it does, doesn't change the length of the mandible alone. It repositions the mandible into the glenoid fossa and some of our MRI studies have proved that, and they are the only studies actually from 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 India actually, uh, which are post uh, uh, post functional fixed appliance in long follow up. We have shown that TMJ adapts to the new place. So mandible not just changes its length; it comes forward, and when it comes forward, it brings back everything forward, which brings the transformation on the facial expression and muscles, and not just in terms of its their position, but also the function. So it is the function of the facial muscles which improves the uh, the entire smile, and that is the occlusion at the deep bone. 
And as you can see in the cephalograms, see the cephalograms from pre, there's a, um, you see that how the entire, um, the pattern, I mean, the skeletal pattern has changed from vertical growth to it has become a normal growth. And that is the incisor mandibular uh, relationship. That is the position of the uh, mandible forward. There was no lip seal reduction of the over z to zero. Here is a change in the nasolabial angle, uh, which is so critical to the profile of a person. Uh, posture of the upper lip, posture of the lower lip, um, their relationship to each other, and of course the respiratory passage. So these benefits within two years, and now to able to provide such comprehensive treatment at a duration which is the least, at a cost which is minimal, and at resources uh, which are limited in terms of providing to the number of people is not a joke, not a joke. So you have to be very, very smart. You have to be very clever to, to develop the priority that whom should you treat first if you have uh, 20 people waiting or 30 people waiting outside your room uh, with having a malocclusion. So one patient I'm going to choose, there may be VIPs, super VIPs and poor rest of poor. I'm going to choose a child who needs to be benefited most. And these are those people, people who are getting to be benefited most because they need it most. They need it most. If I don't help him, nobody's going to help him, but there are people who can be helped uh, by so many other people. So these were the pre-treatment. Uh, another case, pre-treatment with a poor family, vertical grower, as you can see, he needed some help to hold the maxilla also backward. And um, what is, you call it, and these are the tubes where you insert the headgear, uh, you hold the maxilla backward, you bring the mandible forward, uh, create from vertical to horizontal, and you create this change for him. And this is without surgery. This is the orthodontics alone. So you help those people. Uh, and I think uh, in return, they bring a lot, uh, lot of good wishes for us, a lot of uh, blessings to the, uh, to the doctors and to the institutions. And many people say that, uh, well, as a dentist, I'm not getting that respect in the society which I should. As an orthodontist, people don't respect me as much as, as I should. So the respect will come when you deliver, when you deliver. So you start delivering, you start delivering, show what you can do for them, do what you can do for them. And if you don't, cannot help them, then you should not expect um, accordingly uh, rewards uh, without, without having offering them a, a, a service uh, which you can. And if the patients appear very late, for example, in this case, he appeared late because he is already into the pubertal spurt, and then there is no time for us to bring the mandible forward. We have only very pubertal peak left for us. And to utilize that smaller time of peak of the puberty, uh, we had no choice to align these teeth and then bring the mandible forward because in this case, the lateral incisors were hindering the forward positioning of the mandible. So we could not do that. And in this case, we took a conscious decision to extract the lateral, which immediately allowed us the mandible forward. And this was followed by extraction of lower four, four to align the lower arch, as you can see in this case. So in 28 months time, uh, the occlusion was, uh, and in this case, that is called canine substitution. So we substituted the lateral incisor with bilateral canines and, and that at, at one year follow-up. So the possibilities to treat, possibilities to help, was, would require uh, a thinking in each case. No two cases or bell occlusion are similar. Sometimes we say that you treat, I did that. No. If this situation would have been, say, two years earlier than he had come to me, I would not have restricted his laterals. I would have aligned, extracted upper four four, aligned the maxillary arts, and given him the functional appliance. But now since he has come to me at a stage when CBMI stage was four or five, as you can see on the, on the cervical vertebra C1, C2, and C3, and that notching has already started appearing, that means we have very little potential of the skeletal growth to, left, to be left. And with this little potential, I had no choice but to, to bring his mandible forward very quickly to take benefit of the remaining residual period of window. And this has resulted in this uh, profile of this patient. And you can see that he has grown now a big boy on follow-up, uh, pre-treatment, after treatment, post-treatment, after functional therapy, post-treatment, and on follow-up, as you can see there. 
And uh, I wish to tell you that because of my significant contribution with this functional appliance therapy, uh, Dr. Clark requested me to write a foreword in his uh, book, um, textbook uh, on functional appliance therapy, uh, which I did very happily. And when, I, when he called me to do that, I asked him that there are so many people in America and Europe and so everywhere uh, who are better suited to write and forward for a book of eminence like by author like you. But he told me that everywhere else I had gone to teach twin block therapy, but you are the only person who came hunting for me in those days of twin block therapy when nobody knew what is twin block. And because of this, and then you came back and researched and did work and that was very, very nice gesture of Dr. Clark. He's, he has become a lifetime friend. He, we are still, he's, although he's 90 plus, but we are good friends and we are in touch. Actually, this girl was referred to me from Assam only. Uh, I think she's in relation with Dr. Bhunya, so I'm taking the liberty of showing this girl, uh, who had significant uh, exposure of the upper lip and gums, which is called high gum line, high smile. And... Uh, most people will think that this is the case for surgery. They will like to do leaf or one osteotomy and take the maxilla up. But I like to use the intrusion arches and treat them non-extraction. Uh, no extractions in this case, and this is the profile after uh, after the treatment without non with non-extraction treatment. And as you can see that there is a significant intrusion of the maxillary arch. And when you use the right mechanics, you don't only intrude teeth, you intrude the entire bone and the gums go with it. And gingiva, this was the pre-treatment occlusion, which was 100% deep bite, uh, crowding, uh, poor profile, crowding in the lower arch. Uh, I used the TMA wire with intrusion. As you can see, then active intrusion wire, keeping the premolars uh, free. And after having done that, that was the outcome. That is the outcome of occlusion. And you have already seen the outcome in terms of profile. And that is the significant change on cephalogram. Uh, this boy is very interesting for me because uh, this uh, boy um, was a class two, impacted no space for the left maxillary canine, fractured incisor, and actually he's son of my one of my colleagues uh, in the IRCH, Dr. Rana, actually. And um, this boy, those days uh, of photography, we used to do photography with the simple cameras. And as you can see, and... Uh, because the father was not ready for any extractions because when he asked me the plan, I said, all for extractions. He said, no way, you can extract teeth of my son. So I said, well, okay, we can do with three extractions, substitute canine, okay, no. Then uh, we discussed another plan. We said, okay, non-extraction in the lower, four, four in the upper. He did not still agree. Then he told me, if you can do, treat my son as non-extraction, I will ask him to go for treatment. Otherwise, we are not going for orthodontic treatment at all. And I had to scratch my mind. I said, what I could do? And that is the time 92, just John Zig had just appeared in one of the articles in DCO. And it was not available in India because you had to import. So I created my own John Zig. I soldered an appliance, uh, which is quite detailed. You can read my article in AJODO, how we did it. But, uh, but just to tell you that this John Zig worked like wonder. And I, in four months time, we could, slide the molar by five millimeter. We could get a space to accommodate the canine. We could uh, align the teeth. And then he comes back, he went to England. He became an engineer working with the uh, company which makes uh, engine for the, he became an aeronautical engineer. Uh, and uh, 16 years later, he comes to me because he comes to me because he, he has gone, he wants to get married now. And I, I was so happy to see his occlusion because his occlusion was so well established. And his retainer, which I gave him um, as a FSW retainer, was still retained, retained in place. So that is the beauty of, of doing good bonding, putting a good retainer. And then I realized that those days there was no fixed, there was no pre-adjusted appliance. We used to bend arches with first order bands. And each bend has retained its beauty in terms of its perfect alignment of the arch. So central, lateral in, canine eminence, premolar, molar rotation. That's what, that is what is the beauty of um, as wise appliance. So, so that was retained, that was maintained. And that is, I think 20 years later, he came back again, 22 years later, he's a big boy. 
and he has a nice occlusion as you can see that occlusion is maintained so that's the follow -up. and now recently we had the new armamentarium with us which is the mini screw implants and i really uh, worked hard to use them in those patients who needed them most for example this lady who is mother of one works in uh, one of our uh, biochemistry department i think as a as a in some lab and uh, she was not happy. She is not happy with her looks, although she is mom of one. So what is her problem? Her problem is she is a, a ethnically from area where the bimaxillary protrusion is very common, and she has missing lower molar. So what could we do? So the one of the advice is that let her have an implant here or a bridge or preferably implant, extract 4-4 and do an mass retraction. And then we developed the concept of universal connector at AIMS that is what was given by me instead of using the direct anchorage we use the indirect anchorage using universal connector with the molar with the conventional technique and substituting this premolar by only three extractions to in the maxilla and on the left side and on the right side we utilize this extraction space of the first molar bringing the second molar forward and and, and taking this entire segment backward so in 11 months time we reach from and there to that was after 11 months and in, I think in 22 months, we were able to close this extraction space, uh, align the upper and lower arches as you can see, all four for extraction space is closed and that was her uh, profile after the treatment. And then she, we lost her follow up. We, I, I sent a message to in her department to please come and she is not coming. And why she is not coming? Because when she, she came to me for treatment, she was mom of one. But two years after the treatment, when she turned up, she was mom of two. So orthodontic treatment can bring about many more changes in life, in the profile and or in the occlusion. And you can see that uh, this is the pre-treatment. This is the after four extraction, three premolar extraction and bringing the first molar forward. You can appreciate the relationship between upper molar and the lower molar. And you can see that this, this yellowness is because of the healthy. I think she, 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 she had a lot of stains when she came after follow up. And you can see in cephalogram what a beautiful maintenance of, of the inter incisor relationship from an acute angle to the, to the physiologically required obtuse angle and the guidance. I mean, that is the beauty of using implants. This was otherwise a case for Baida surgery. So a mini screw implant can convert a Baida surgery into a non extension treatment. Another this uh, girl who is working in some as a home in some home as a as a as a home, housekeeper and uh, was was obviously not happy with her protrusion you can see that how acute is her protrusion and and then i had to use the same method of treatment as i use in the physical using implants using them in maximum anchorage and 27 months time i was able to give her a good profile and a good occlusion and this girl was coming from Jamia, actually, a close near Jamia, uh, was a case for surgery, but because the mini screw implant and is supported, I was able to treat her in, in the same duration of time. Uh, as you can see the amount of protrusion here, actually. Uh, you see the interlabial gap and you see the interlabial gap now. Uh, nobody would treat this case uh, without uh, Baiza surgery, but the implants and the technique which I developed using the um, which is called the universal connector using indirect anchorage uh, we were able to do it so these are the post treatment picture of this girl and this adult girl lady uh, who came to me i had just returned from australia and she says i was waiting for she was waiting for me to be treated because i had looked after her a little bit and then i went abroad uh, as a visiting professor to sydney and uh, the, her problem is because she has a severe periodontal disease and migration of teeth in the deep bite. And uh, I treated her that time with self-ligation because I was also new to self-ligation treatment that time. And this is over follow-up over the years. So having brought her using the, and, and this extra space providing her with a small uh, bridge. And uh, she has been in constant follow-up with me for years after years. So 2004, now 2000. 20, uh, I have about 16 years of uh, contact relationship with her as a, a patient and a doctor. So 
so if i have to to summarize i would say that uh, that the early treatment has significant benefits diagnosis is important i try to develop our own methods of treatment we have tried to maximize the encourage and technology and then we let us talk a little bit about collaboration and rewards so this lady who two children i had treated for orthodontics was not happy with her with her problem because she had a bridge made in the lower jaw and since she had a bridge her upper teeth had started migrating with this as uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a periodontal migration and the gaps coming up between central and the lateral and when i took her x rays and everything i realized that she had implants the lower jaw and and she had crowns over the implant so implants look very nice stable and happy but there is a little problem in these implants so what is the problem the problem is not with the osseous integration problem is with the placement of implant so what is the problem in placement of implants the placement problem is that this particular implant should have been more vertical because of the angle in which it has been placed has caused lot of trauma up onto the upper incisors and that has resulted in the uh, in the movement so we had to rethink redo i treated her orthodontically in the upper arch uh, we had to create a bridge with change angulation of the crowns alone i think dr brahma would be able to tell something better to us about this case and then that is how she has been happy she is um, happy and her two sons are also happy whom i had treated before so i had a personal situation clinical situations when i faced in that i treated many children and after having treated these children i had to treat their moms so those who could not get their treatment because of whatsoever reasons so now the taboo of getting orthodontic treatment in adulthood is gone uh, you could, and with the particularly with the now new techniques Uh, with the aligners, uh, the more and more adults are taking treatment. This is the last case I wish to share with you. That this boy who came to me from Bihar actually uh, never had his uh, treatment before uh, in terms of the orthodontics, but he has some treatment on the lip. So, and he also had the similar situation of uh, I had to close the space in the lower jaw, this side, and also on this side. So, so who? this boy would look like this is 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 now like that so and now the issue is that after i treated him uh, with uh, with orthodontics and lip revision which was done by my colleagues in plastic surgery um, he became a friend and as a friend now he's asking me that you have treated my my one problem i look very good i'm very happy now i can find a and he had come to delhi just to find a job as well as matrimony and now he wants me that since you have treated me my nose my lip and my teeth now how how do you treat my baldness so that is what i can't offer him so that is the other part of the story so i just mentioned to me as the cleft palate is my major interest and uh, that is a separate subject for me to teach you some other time when if there is an opportunity for me uh, i wish to say that uh, you could make their these children their life as happy as this because this particular woman who she is now has become a dentist is in our faculty actually um, uh, was treated for cleft lip and palate and uh, she has also become a lifetime friend um, and it is very rare that some person with deformity may invite you to the marriage but she was so confident and happy that we were present in her marriage and also of course interacted with her has went and the family so that is the joy of treatment uh, some of the cases which i have shown you here are rather many of them are in my book so if you want to read you can read much more there um, there can be more opportunities to interact through email or through digital media but i wish to tell you that uh, the scope to serve the society is 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 humongous is humongous and i would think that i mean one life is not enough Uh, the variety of patients the variety of patients who are and the number of patients who suffer because of so many different reasons so when you are looking orthodontics don't just look at the teeth be a biologist be a you are not treating a malocclusion you are treating a human you are treating a body so take care of his profile his respiration 
functions of the um, functions of the stomatognathic system, the, the TM joint, and of course, as a as a human. Uh, I hope uh, I have done justice to the time which was given to me. Uh, with these words, I like to thank Dr. Bhuyan, uh, Dr. Deka, Dr. Mithali Bora, and all the staff who have been corresponding with me, uh, Dr. Channa, and a few of the names which I have, I can't remember, but I know I have a lot of appreciation for them for doing all the work, make it possible for me to deliver this lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to write questions to me, answer questions to me. I can reply you by email or or you can do in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the illuminating session. And uh, we request you, we request you to kindly accept our deepest gratitude in this token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Our next prominent speaker is Dr. Gopi Krishna. And here is a brief profile of his illustrious career. Dr. V. Gopi Krishna is currently working as adjunct professor at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai, and as the secretary for International Federation of Endodontic Associations, as well as general secretary for the Indian Board of Endodontics. He is the editor-in-chief of the Endodontology Journal and the associate editor of European Endodontic Journal. He is also the founder director of Root Canal Foundation based at Chennai, India. He is the editor of eight editions of three reputed textbooks, Grossman's Endodontic Practice, 12th, 13th and 14th editions, Sturdivant's Art and Science of Operative Dentistry, 1st and 2nd South Asia edi editions, Preclinical Manual of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, 1st, 2nd and 3rd editions. Dr. Gopi Krishna has presented over 300 invited podium lectures globally. And he has more than 35 Scopus Index publications and also is the editor-in-chief of the PubMed Index Journal of Conservative Dentistry from 2008 to 2016. He is also the organizing secretary for the 12th IFEA World Endodontic Congress to be held in India in Chennai in August 2021. Thank you, sir, for thank you, sir, for gracing this occasion. I request you to deliver the talk on uh, access opening and light path. Over to you, Dr. Gopi Krishna. Uh, thank you, sir. I hope I'm audible, Dr. Lima. Yes, you are. Fine. Is my screen uh, present there? Is it fine? Yes, yes. We can we fine. can see your screen. Okay, let me just give me a second. Is it on a full screen or how is it now? It is not on a full screen, sir. Right now, yeah, that should be okay. Yep. Uh, thank you for your kind words of uh, introduction. And it's an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege uh, uh, to be part of this uh, symposium. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be invited from your esteemed university and by Dr. Buyan, sir. Um, Dr. Buyan, sir, is aware of this fact that as a postgraduate student in 1999, uh, I gave my first presentation as a student in uh, the national conference conducted by sir at Guwahati. And it still remains my uh, one of my most memorable trips to, to Guwahati. Um, thank you, sir, for the kind invite. And uh, today, in the next 25 minutes allotted to me, I would like to enlighten the, the students and the practitioners here about uh, certain concepts about access opening and glide path management. Uh, now, yes. So now, if you look at uh, my slide, I would always call certain things in life as laws. And uh, when I say laws, they are very important. And one of the most important laws is this on magnification. Uh, when we talk about endodontics, we need to do, we need to, we can do it with our eyes and our fingers, but you can never reach the perfection what we want unless we have certain aids. And the difference between me as a student 20 years back and my students currently is this, that we are able to uh, see things better, hence we are able to do things better. So. Uh, one of the most important things which I would advise anyone who's interested in endodontics is to uh, get uh, incorporate a magnification aid in their practice. And one of the most important aids is having a dental loop. 
And uh, I want to start my presentation with this because most of my students and clinicians who come and ask me, they end up buying the cheapest loop on the market and then they're not quite happy with it and then they don't really understand the power of magnification. Hence, of all the loops, what you see here, the most important loop is what I would recommend is a loop which is customized for your eyes. So a loop is something which you need to customize it. And uh, I would strongly recommend a TTL loop of at least 2.5x magnification. And if you are an endodontist, doing a 3x, at least 3.0x magnification is sensible. And when we say, how do we customize a loop? The customization is based on your height. Uh, as for a person like me, who is more than six feet tall, uh, when I sit and work on my patient, I'm much more farther away from the patient. Hence, my focal distance from my eyes to the patient is much more than the average Indian height. So if you are a shorter person, you would be much closer to the patient. Hence, the working distance of a loop can vary from 30 to 50 centimeters, 300 to 500 millimeters. Hence, I use a loop of around 430 millimeters, which is customized for my eyes. Similarly, my interpupillary distance, the distance between the eyes of each individual will vary according to the, the size of the face. And hence, the IPD would vary Hence, it is very important uh, that you get your to meet the optometrist and get your interpupillary distance checked. And based on that, it would be anywhere as low as 58 to 62 in, in, in girls to, to people who are well-built or having a larger jaw size and face size, they might go up to 70 millimeters. So based on this, you would go and ask a, a person to, uh, to, or, or a, a company to customize a loop for you. So when you buy a loop, my recommendations are threefold. Make sure you buy somewhere between 2.5 to 3.2x if you're doing endo. Uh, make sure you go and check your height and based on your height and your focal. Uh, when students ask me, how do I find my focal length? It's very simple. Uh, take a sit down in, in, uh, and work on a patient and ask your assistant to measure from your eye level to the, your, to the level of the patient's mouth. Hence, you will be able to know what is the distance at which your eyes are away from the patient. Uh, so that's what I would recommend. And here, if you look at me here, what you see here next is that this is how in the times of COVID with the way we work has changed. Hence, even with uh, all this, so the basic way I work uh, from June 3rd, I've started working every single day for the last few months and uh, aerosol generating procedures every single day I am doing. And uh, what we have understood is if you, if you are able to protect yourself in the right way, we can continue doing uh, general dentistry, including aerosol generating procedures without any problem. Hence, you would see me here with the full scape drapes, with the double glove and uh, N95 mask, followed by a normal three-layered mask, followed by a face shield, and I use my loop inside the face shield. Hence, when I'm doing my routine examination and non-AGP procedures or non-microscope procedures, this is how I work. Whereas when I'm going to do any procedure which is, involves complexity, I would use a microscope and this is how I would uh, sit and work on my, uh, on my system. So you would see here that uh, what you see is my microscope and uh, what you see now is the different aspects of what all I use in my microscope. Uh, you would see my uh, two aerator hand pieces on the side, and this is just giving you a workflow of how, how we work ergonomically. Uh, micromotor, uh, ultrasonic unit, uh, you will get your normal three-way syringe, a Stropco irrigator, uh, you get your endomotor, which could be cordless, you could have your apex locator, you'll have your down pack and your backfill machine. And this is what a basic uh, endo armamentarium of uh, anybody wanting to do endodontics uh, should be. And this is how every single day a workflow is present for me. And when it comes to access opening, so today in 20 minutes more, what I'm trying to convey is two important concepts of how should be the access be. Traditional accesses used to be this, which used to be in the form of boxes, which is uh, like this. Hence, we used to uh, prepare huge amounts of tooth structure to get this, what we used to call as pure straight line access. Then we have what is now considered as conservative endodontic uh, cavities, which are basically a little inverted, truncated, hence you are able to conserve more amount of tooth structure. And the last is what uh, very famous on Facebook. These are known as ninja accesses. They are very microscopic accesses. And some of the clinicians abroad, they use 
CBCT scans before and hence they know the exact positions of the access openings and they are able to just drill micro holes through the tooth so that they are able to do this. So a lot of my students ask me what is the right uh, access opening technique. Uh, the left one is also obsolete. TEC, which is the traditional endodontic cavity, is also uh, obsolete. We do not recommend it. I also do not recommend the so-called ninja or the, or the truss accesses, which are very microscopic in nature, uh, for two simple reasons. A is that uh, you need a CBCD scan before every of such access. You cannot work without a CBCD scan because you don't know how many canals are inside. And in India and uh, in, in routine clinical practice, uh, we understand that a CBCT for every single tooth okay, undergoing endo is no longer advocated. And secondly, we have also found evidence that just because you are conserving the tooth a little more, we have realized studies are telling us that it really does not increase the fracture resistance significantly. Obviously, when we preserve some tooth structure, we are preserving good sound tooth, but it does not significantly increase the uh, the fracture resistance. Hence, if you ask me, the axis preparation which I would recommend is something like this. Not what you see on the left, but what you see on the right. What you see on the right is a modification of an uh, axis opening done by me. And what you see here is you are conservative. You are not preparing too much of tooth structure. You are not compromising the pericervical dentin. And hence, yet you have designed uh, the axis in a way. And here, I would like to ask all the students to understand what is known as the law of concentricity. Uh, this law, which came into endodontics only about 15 years back, is probably the most important law of an axis opening. And what it simply is telling you is the shape of your axis opening should mimic the shape of the tooth. So no more preformed shapes of triangles, boxes, or rectangles. So this tooth, if you look at it, the outer shape of the tooth and the axis opening shape and the floor of the pulp chamber are all mimicking each other. So that's the most important uh, uh, attribute or take home point when you're trying to do axis opening. The other important aspect of axis opening is what is we call as caries um, uh, related, related axis opening, wherein we, we try to go through where the caries is. So in this case, of a, of if you look at the central incisor with the cervical class Y root caries, Instead of doing a traditional palatal axis, the axis is being done through the uh, through the uh, through the cervical part of the tooth itself, and hence you can see here that instead of cutting out the the main stress bearing structure, which is the single limb of the tooth, here I'm approaching my axis through the labial cervical margin itself. I enter through that. I'm including doing my rotary cleaning, shaping, and uh, uh, stepwise thing. Obviously, we did a little bit of uh, uh, crown lengthening here to make sure that I get, I do not violate the biologic width. And the whole procedure is done through this kind of a modified uh, uh, access opening, including the obturation and backfill techniques. Uh, so, access opening needs to be two points. One should be caries related from where the caries is happening, and second, using law of the concentricity. And in order to make our access opening more conservative and more refined, uh, if you ask me what are the newer advances which we use, is the use of ultrasonic and a special, a special burrs, which are known as the MUNCE burrs, M-U-N-C-E. The left burrs, what you see, are called MUNCE burrs, and what you see on the right are, are StarTex ultrasonic tips. These are very good ultrasonic tips to, to remove pulp stones and to remove ledges, to, remove, uh, to aid you in your access refinement. So when you do an access opening, uh, one of the important things is when I start an access opening is I make sure I always flood the canal with hypochlorite. People normally think that hypochlorite is an irrigant and it is normally used when we are doing the root canal uh, inside the shaping and cleaning. But I, when I enter the pulp chamber itself, I start flooding the, the pulp chamber with hypochlorite because it's a very useful way for not only removing the debris, but keeps the tooth structure, the moist and its ability to cleanse and remove the debris is far superior to normal saline. So you can see here, stepwise, I, I refine the axis, I make it uh, conservative, and here I keep flooding the pulp chamber with hypochlorite, and I'm able to trace my canals. In this case, there is an MB1 and an MB2 in this case. That's MB1, and that's your MB2 uh, in this case, which is easily traced with the help of ultrasonics. So using hypochlorite and having a good isolation is key. 
And when people ask me about hypochlorite in India, hypochlorite is not very popular. The reason why it's not popular is because people do not use the rubber dam. If you start using the rubber dam, you will start loving hypochlorite because you will not be scared of hypochlorite. People who do not use hypochlorite are basically people who do not use rubber dams. So if you ask me what one take home point from this short seminar is that if you want to improve your clinical prognosis, you want to improve your clinical prognosis of outcomes, then you need to disinfect the canals and disinfection of canals can be only done with hypochlorite. So indirectly speaking, the use of a rubber dam is directly correlated with superior outcomes. So people think rubber dam is basically used to prevent aspirations. But if you ask me, only if you use rubber dams, you would get superior outcomes uh, because of your ability to use hypochlorite. Here, I'm going to show you a short video of uh, using ultrasonics uh, for how to remove pulp stones. And uh, here you would see that we are using an ultrasonic tip and uh, you're using, uh, the ultrasonic tips are connected to your normal scaler and these scalers are kept at low intensity. And what we do is we slowly start to activate them at say power four or power five. And what it does is it will start to break the stones into small pieces. Uh, this is done without the use of any water. So you're able to visualize better. And the other advantage of this technique is since the ultrasonic tip is of very short diameter, your ability to visualize is very good. Unlike a handpiece, where the head of the handpiece would block your view. When I use an ultrasonic tip, it is very, very easy to, to, to see what, what is happening. Oops, I'm sorry, I need to, uh, one second, I made a mistake. Excuse me one second. Give me one second. Okay. So I go to this point. So stone into small pieces and only if you remove the pulp stone you'll be able to visualize the canal now here you can see even pulp tissue under the pulp stone and uh, and also the presence of an mb2 canal here and uh, your ability to visualize things very clearly under the microscope so it's a very very useful way in which uh, uh, you can uh, visualize things and here you are uh, the presence of initially how the tooth is after the pulp stone is removed and then uh, the second image is showing you how you trace the mesobar buckle to canal and after you shape and enlarge A DB1 and DB2, which is two distal, distal buccal canals and two palatal canals, a total of seven canals in this case. And uh, if you actually see the, the access opening, and this is your MB1, 2, and 3, and this is your DB1 and DB2, and the palatal is a single canal which splits at the, at the apex. So if you look at this uh, X-ray post-op, on the right-hand side, uh, on the mesiobuccal canal, you can see there are three canals fusing. Whereas on the left-hand side, you can see the two distal buckles and the two distinct palatal canals. It's a seven canal case. Hence, the ability to find extra canals is enhanced not only because of magnification, but your ability to also see, uh, uh, get things done because of understanding the loss of access opening. So it's very common to get uh, extra canals in the maxillary molar, MB1, MB2, or MB3, or like in this. And again, there is a huge variation whether the canals are going to be close to each other, like the case in the left, or they are going to be much, much more distinct as in the case in the right. So that's how is the difference. Now, when it comes to, uh, to the next aspect, which is on, um, if, if you ask me in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, people have been so much more focused on, on shaping. Uh, for the last 20 years, we keep talking about what are the, the, the new 
files which are coming into the market and what, what how are the each file better than the other but nobody talks about cleaning and if you want to end up doing cleaning you need to do shaping first but cleaning is the key if you want to get success in the end so if you want to disinfect infected canals which is what every student wants every clinician wants why do we do a root canal we want to disinfect the infected canals if you want to disinfect the infected canals then canal patency is the key to success so canal patency is the most important uh, step when it when you ask me how to do good uh, root canals so how do you do canal patency canal patency can be only achieved with the help of uh, of stainless steel files you cannot do canal patency with nickel titanium files so every student comes and ask me which is the which is the best file in endodontics this is a common question which is the best file in endodontics uh, they'll ask me different companies i uh, whether files in endodontics is your k files your stainless steel k files but not all the sizes not all the sizes you need to use only size 8 and size 10 of k files before i make you understand uh, what this uh, uh, files are all about let us first understand a fundamental question there is two instruments which are the which are the foundational instruments of hand instrumentation which is which is k files and k reamers everybody knows k files k reamers and h files now when you look at files and reamers we also have two motions called filing motions and reaming motions so it's common sense to understand that a file should be used in filing motion and a reamer should be used in reaming motion because the names are like that but don't ask me why but a file should not be used in filing motion and a reamer should not be used in reaming motion so so that's a great uh, that's a, one of the biggest paradoxes of endodontics if you ask me what is the right way to use these instruments a file should be used in a reaming motion and a reamer should be used in a filing motion so this is the paradox hence since we use k files as our first primary instrument to create canal patency it is most important to understand that you use these k files in a reaming motion and the reaming motion should not exceed more than 45 degrees i would show you a video now of how i do my my patency and shaping protocol so that that is a self explanatory for you to understand how to do uh, routine rotary endodontics for any student or clinician but before understanding this the other instruments so what are the instruments which are so so important for us to do uh, rotary endodontics uh as i told you the most important are the size 8 and size 10 k files they are the most important files in anyone's armamentarium so if you cannot do any type of rotary endodontics without these two fundamental files and i will show you how to pre curve them and how do you use them in a video after this with which i end, end the presentation and ab- apart from these two files there's one more file called a uh, are called rotary path files uh, a example like proglider these are files which help us shape the canal to the size 15 and above uh, without enlarging the canal so they basically like your 15 or 16 size size k files but they are used in rotary fashion and they are always used after you first use your 8 and 10 k file so now i would sh- run a video to make you understand how uh, how i i would uh, um, i would uh, go ahead with um, my uh, rotary shaping protocol so here we are so what you see here is the first thing is a pre curved uh, size 8k file this is my favorite file and i'll always pre curve it uh, if you, and the pre curve should not be an acute curvature it should be a generalized uh, uh, generalized curvature in the middle third and once you have this pre curve file you would start going in here i'm working on a transparent model wherein we are trying to shape both the uh, mb1 and mb2 and what you see here is when i enter the root canal you would see that i'm going in a 45 degree reaming motion and that's what we are doing a 45 degree reaming motion with which you would enter into the canal slowly crown down you are in no hurry to enter up to the working length so this is what you do and the same thing you would do on the mb2 canal 
And, uh, and what you do is the same. Here we are going to into the MB2 canal, and here what you do is again size 8K file in a slow reaming motion. You will always use the size 8 reaming motion. That's in the reaming motion going up to the estimated working length. Here you see me rotating in a 45 degree reaming motion as we negotiate into the canal. Once you reach the estimated working length, you keep reaming at the working length. I think there's a connection error here. We would like to wait for her to get back. We're trying to connect to Dr. Gopi Krishna. So that, yes, he's here. Can you unmute? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, we lost. Uh, um, can you see my screen now, please? Yes, yes, sir, we can. So I go back to the same point. Give me a second. So we had done this. We went from eight and size 10 patency. So as I told you, when you do this patency, you go up to the, ah, okay, this is where we have. After you complete with size eight, now you start with your size mm. 10. Both these files are always pre-curved. And as you enter into the root canal, you would see that you are doing at a 45 degree reaming motion and you try to go up, negotiate up to the working length. And this is what you do. And once you reach the working length, as I was telling you, never remove the file immediately. One of the key things is you need to use the reaming motion at the working length for at least 15, 20 seconds. So the reaming motion takes more time than the rotary motion. So canal patency takes more time than the rotary files. And if you watch me here, I'm at the working length and I'm keeping on reaming so that I don't lose the working length. I don't pack the debris there. This is very important and a common mistake. Students go up to the working length and remove it out. Now I'm into the MB2 canal. And you see that as I enter into the MB2 canal, I do the same way. I do the reaming in a in a in a very small in a 45 degree reaming motion, and I reach up to the working length. Once I do this, once I do this, I keep as I told you, I I do not remove the file. The moment you remove the file, you are removing the debris along with it. And the next time you enter the canal, you will push the debris in. Hence, when I do reaming motion. I will never remove the file outside the canal. I'm always working inside the canal. Uh, again, a very important clinical tip. Do not keep on inserting and removing the file. Once I did this and I have achieved the canal patency, I would normally do a crown down technique wherein I will always, I believe in uh, enlarging the orifice uh, so that it is easier for the irrigant to flow in and also to ensure that we are able to do crown down more effectively and also enhance the life of our rotary files. So here you would see I'm going to use an orifice enlarger, which if you watch me, I will go only about three to four millimeters into the canal. I will not enlarge more than that. Three to four millimeters into the canal, and that's it, two to three motions, and remove it off, that's all. That's all is required. So if you measure from the orifice to the depth, I'm not going more than three to four millimeters. And my time here is only five seconds. That's it, it will take for me to enlarge the orifice and always irrigate copiously between each instrument change. Once that is done, now I'm going to use a rotary path file. This is a path file which would enlarge my canal to size 15. No matter which company rotary file you use, if you enlarge the canal to size 15, it makes life very easy for every rotary file. 
So only eight and 10 with stainless steel files and the size 15, which always with a rotary K file, rotary file used with any company. And here you see, I am enlarging with small picking motions, which goes all the way up to the working length here. I enlarge that in the MB1 and similarly, I'm using short picking motion. And each time this picking motion is happening, it is entering the canal by only two to three millimeters. I'm advancing by two to three millimeters and here I am enlarged up to the working length. So now the canal is easy to do shaping to complete the case. You can use any rotary file. Whichever company rotary file you do start crown down technique here, I'm using true anatomy system. And here, when I do down, uh, crown down, within 10 seconds each, not more than 10 seconds per canal. That's all, is how much time I take to do shaping. Because you do crown down properly with short picking motions, eight to 10 seconds you reach working length. So here we have enlarged in size 20. Now what I will do is irrigate, recapitulate, and use size 25 now. And this is what I'm gonna to do to enlarge my canal to 25, 6% this is what my, my obturation in this canal is, is going to be. So I go down, crown down again to 2506 on this canal and come out and do the same in the MB2 canal also, which is fusing to the working length. So what you are doing here is obviously this is a transparent model. So you can see what I'm doing. And here I'm using a 30 gauge flexible needle, irisafe safe needles with which I can irrigate the apical third. So my needle can go two mm short of the working length. So you can see in spite of irrigation, you will see debris in the apical third. So recapitulation is very important. If you don't use a size eight or size 10 to recapitulate, you will never be able to remove this debris from the apical third. Now, once your canals have been irrigated, now it's very simple. You, you, you can dry the canals with the, GP, uh, master, uh, the paper points and then use a master cone of the same uh, size and taper. So you will see here, I'm using the same size and taper and I'm placing both in the MB1 and MB2. I'm placing the GP points and you would see the canals will fuse at the apical third. And that's how uh, you would obturate this case with MB1 and MB2 is fusing at the apical third of the canal. So in such cases, now the sealer application, uh, people ask me, which is the best way, the one of the best ways is to use the master cone itself. So I don't use lentilos, I use the master cone. And here you can see me with the help of master cone, I'm placing the sealer inside. And once you place a sealer again, take it out and gently pump the GP point with the, with the uh, sealer inside. So what it does is it compacts the sealer well inside. And then when you use a down pack or a backfill, you get a fantastic uh, obturation. So canal, uh, sorry. Uh, so canal shaping and obturation is very, very straightforward. Uh, if you are able to uh, understand and get a canal patency. So in my opinion, doing shaping obturation and cleaning is very easy if you are able to get the access opening and canal patency right. So I would like to conclude this presentation by telling uh, this wonderful statement that the most important aspect of root canal operation is that it should be done with much more care and thoroughness. And this statement was made by Edmund Noyes in 1926, close to 100 years back, the statement was made. It does not talk about any equipment. It does not talk about any instrument. It only talks about the operator. That if you want to do good root canals, you should do it with much more care and thoroughness. And the care and thoroughness comes from the operator and not from any instrument or any other device. So if you ask me how to get things done, invest on magnification, at least get a dental loop. And if you start using the right instruments, the basic K file and basic instruments in the right way. And if you can bring in some ultrasonic tips or a burst for enhancing your access preparation, then doing root canals is a very enjoyable aspect. So I would like to thank the organizers, uh, uh, especially. Uh, I would like to thank them for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to come to Guwahati and speak to you. Uh, all of you are aware that I run my Root Canal Foundation programs all over the world, and those who are interested can be in touch with me. If you have any questions about this program or any questions, you can always WhatsApp me, message me on this number, which is my personal mobile number. And also you can visit my website if you're interested in any other uh, information or downloads or uh, information about my textbooks and my articles and my courses. So it's an absolute pleasure.
uh, Dr. Chandana, Dr. Lee Madas, uh, Dr. Briyan sir for all this wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you once again uh, and wish you the very best in life and endodontics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopi Krishna. We know you have a flight to catch and we are running late, but thank you so much for making this, for being a part of this webinar and for this wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you once you. again. Thank you. So kindly accept this uh, token of appreciation from us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So our last speaker is the young but not less accomplished oral and maxillofacial surgeon from Regional Dental College, Guwahati, Dr. Parthasarathi Chakravarti. He is the Assistant Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Regional Dental College, Guwahati. He is the only maxillofacial surgeon from Northeast India to acquire a university-affiliated postgraduate fellowship in head and neck oncology from Srimanta Shankaradevi University, and he is the only surgeon from Northeast India to be selected for FHNO, that is Foundation of Head and Neck Oncology Travel Fellow, Head and Neck Services, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Chakravarti is also the only surgeon from Northeast India to be selected for AOCMF Fellowship in Maxillofacial Oncology and Reconstructive Surgery, Ninth People's Hospital, Shanghai a young, motivated, and hardworking individual passionate about improving head and neck cancer care in northeastern part of India. Today, he will be speaking on pre-malignant oral lesions and early diagnosis, including biopsy. So over to you, Dr. Chakrabar. Thank you, Nava, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so very good afternoon to all of you, one and all. And I hope you are doing uh, well and good. I hope I'm audible. Okay. So uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. A.C. Bhuya, sir, Dr. Deepika Dekamian, Dr. Chandra, ma'am, and Lima Dasba for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, it's a privilege and honor. At the same time, it's a daunting task for me to match up with the stalwarts who have spoken just before me. And I hope I can do justice to it. So I ask your kind uh, preservance to be to bear with this lecture for the next 25 minutes or so. And please excuse me if I shake or be nervous in the in the in between. So I'd like to share uh, my screen. Just wait. I'm sorry, it's taking a bit of time. Lisa, sorry for the delay. It's taking some time here. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, pre-malignant oral lesions. So the idea is to how to catch them early. So uh, again, I think there's a problem here. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, uh, before going to the main topic, let's uh, do some. Uh, you know, general knowledge uh, questionnaire or webinar kind of thing. So, well, I would have loved to be in a live audience so that I can, uh, you know, get your answers as such. But uh, let's see if it's working. So, national sport, we all know it's hockey. National bird, we all know it's a peacock. National animal, it's a royal Bengal tiger. National emblem, it's your Ashok Chakra. And uh, 
national food is armed somehow my slide share is not working is it is it can you see it's coming as pdf pdf i'll just take a moment I'm sorry, it's coming as PDF. I don't know how, but uh, let's go about this. So, this is our national mouth. It must be, huh? It's coming yeah, it's as a PDF. Yeah, okay. And uh, well, this is our national cancer. But the above picture was a bit of a funny, but this is not at all funny, and this is really scary. And uh, well, as far as the oral cancer is concerned, it's actually a global burden. And as of now, a uh, lot of uh, developments have taken place in terms of uh, your cancer research, treatment, and whatnot. But the fact remains that in spite of knowing all the causative factors, which we all know very well, and the factors that, you know, it's been creeping up more into the young people. Previously, we thought it is a disease of a, old people but now it's actually a you know more and more young people are coming up with this disease so and yes after a lot of developments everything we still have very very less improvement when it comes to oral cancer survival and you know uh, lifetime survival so what is that is missing where we can actually act on it so it's, it's actually keeps your head thinking right so uh, the idea is so the idea is catch the bird early before it flies away you know you have to got to catch it early before it takes the shape of a cancer or something else so how how do we go about this you know so we have a uh, two kind of two scenarios one is primary prevention and one is secondary prevention so i had a video there but i, I hope it's not playing because it's coming in the pdf format so well your primary prevention means you know you're talking to masses you are reaching out to the public and you're you're teaching them how to you know go about it you have to stop tobacco what not and the secondary prevention is when a when a physician he he sees and detects the cancer early and that is very important you know right because uh, the video i was about to play was that you know uh, it shows that uh, the first video showed that the one uh, one man has been you know uh, gunning with a single bullet and single bullet kills only a one person but the second video uh, there's an arrow which goes and it creates a multiple arrows and creates multiple people so you know how our aim should be so if we teach and every physician especially the dental surgeons who are working in the rural areas and the and the on all the uh, primary sex cancer center primary prevention they all are being taught they all match early so reach out to the more and more people in a very easy way so it's not common but published in Lancet. Lancet is the largest, you know, one of the most important publishing paper. And uh, so it says, and there was a study run in India only when uh, they educated uh, health workers so that they went and they uh, screened screen people, those who had high, uh, you know, premalignant lesions and those who did not have. And subsequently, they found that this oral screening only, only oral screening by healthcare workers actually led to very good survival of this oral cancer cases so when it comes to oral cancers it's not like any other cancers in the body right because if just just think if you have people have stomach cancer people has you know uh, gallbladder cancer so they come to know it very late until else it's it's too late because it's it generally is not does not give them as such but when it comes to oral cavity 
uh, we, we know we have causative factors. We know what is actually is causing the cancer and it has a natural progression. It does not go straight away to cancer in a, in a single day or so or a week. It takes a lot of long, long time and more and more, there's no specialized instruments required. You can just, just have a look inside the oral cavity and you can see what is going wrong. So it's so simple still. And as I was talking about oral cancer progression, so as you can see in the slide, you know, uh, it goes from a normal mucosa to hyperplastic to dysplasia, moderate, severe dysplasia, and then it goes to a frank squamous cell carcinoma. So we have, we have a barrier, we have an area where we can actually come and you know, tackle upon the disease and we can just break the barriers there and we can just stop the progression of, of a disease to oral cancer. So the important factor come here is to know about pre-malignant disorders. So many people would say uh, pre-malignant lesions, pre-malignant conditions, no, what not, but uh, WHO in 2004 has categorized all this under pre-malignant disorder, uh, potentially malignant disorders rather. Why potentially malignant disorders? Because not every lesion turns out to be an oral cancer, but they can be potentially malignant so that we have to take care of this and those lesions can actually turn to uh, cancer. They are not pre-malignant, but they are potentially malignant. So what comes under this uh, heading? We have leukoplakia, erythroplakia, oral lichen planus, submucous fibrosis, and then we have some generalized uh, systemic factors which can cause oral cancer. So we are not talking about in this seminar about the systemic uh, lesion, but we'll talk about the what are the oral potentially malignant disorders. So first is leukoplakia. Leukoplakia is nothing, you know, nothing. So first of all, you should know that leukoplakia is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to have exclude all other white lesions then you come to a diagnosis of leukoplakia. So leukoplakia is nothing but a white patch or a white plaque on, in the surface of mucosa, which cannot be rubbed away and which cannot be termed as any other lesion. So it is always a diagnosis of exclusion. And though the, uh, the chance and the, the, uh, the survival or the transformation rates are not as high, but you have to take care when you have leukoplakia in females, leukoplakia in a ventral surface of the tongue or a floor of mouth, or you have a leukoplakia more than two centimeters or the leukoplakia is present for more than a decade or so, or you have some super added infection like candida on top of it, or if it is a non-homogeneous type. So the, when these factors are there, you know that these are high risk factors and you have to take care accordingly. So as you can see, uh, the first picture on your left would be a very early thin uh, leukoplakia. Then you have homogeneous leukoplakia, very firm leukoplakia. Then you have speckle. The speckle is nothing, the intermixed modular kind of lesions. And you can see that all the, all the percentage increases as it goes down. And then you have proliferative varicose leukoplakia where the chance of formation is highest. So, but, but the green light is that you know, the transformation occurs in a very slow manner. It does not goes to become a cancer straight away. So you have a long window period where I can actually, you know, uh, see the thing and you can just take some action on it. So next, so these are all different kinds of liquid, but as the, all the picture, you can say that it's sometimes very difficult and you will find uh, it's mixed, you know, you have a homogeneous pattern along with a non-homogeneous pattern. You have a homogeneous, you know, have a thin leukoplakia along with a varicose leukoplakia. So when this mixture is there, then it's, it's bound to be a high risk category. So now we're coming to erythroplakia. Again, as same as the leukoplakia, it is always a diagnosis of exclusion. So it is nothing but a red velvety patch in the oral mucosa, which cannot be rubbed away and which cannot be termed as any other red lesions. So you have to exclude all other red lesions before coming on to diagnosis of erythroplakia. And one of the most important factor about leukoplakia is that it, these lesions are never ever symptomatic only until there is super added infection or anything else. When they begin with, they are always asymptomatic always. So that is a diagnostic criteria for them. And more or less, they are always 
solitary most of the times if you find that there is a uh, these white and red lesions are present uh, diffuse areas then you know that it can be something else so most likely they are lipoplic and erythroplic are most of the times they are solitary lesions and they are asymptomatic again erythroplic can be of different types it can be homogeneous it can be erythrolipoplic where you have a red and white lesion in term next and you have a nodular erythroplakia where uh, you can say speckled erythroplakia so as compared to leukoplakia erythroplakia is considered as a dangerous because because the chance of malignant transformation is very much high when the it's erythroplakia when you see erythra you know that it is calling for danger and you have to take your action immediately so you can see all these four pictures over there and uh, the first look would say that these are erythroplakia but as i told you erythroplakia is a diagnosis of exclusion so uh, you have to have exclude all other things so when you say this uh, reticular thing this is actually lichen planus basically a uh, on a that is candidiasis and the gingiva that is actually a high grade periodontitis so you have to exclude all these things when prevalent gen uh, or condition in this indian subcontinent and uh, uh, not much of uh, research has been done on oral submucous fibrosis the reason being it's a disease of indian subcontinent and most of the research happens in the west so we people living in the indian subcontinent have to find some solution for this submucous fibrosis submucous fibrosis is nothing you know it's a generalized fibrosis of oral mucosa and it's actually not because of tobacco not because of smoking it's actually because of betel nut and the ingredients in the betel nut ericoline ericodine and guanidine these are the three ingredients which actually cause uh, this fibrosis so again coming to this oral submucous fibrosis you have to know that what are the symptoms so early to begin uh, like leukoplakia and erythroplakia the fibrosis they start this with symptoms so leukoplakia and erythroplakia you don't get symptoms to begin with but in submucous fibrosis the the symptoms are the beginning of the lesion they are the beginning uh, sign so what is that people will say about burning sensation and so on so people will be have difficulty in eating spicy food and so on and gradually it will develop to atrophic mucosa and you'll find some fibrous band and so on so we can uh, you know classify it to four grades or so and gradually the mouth will the mouth opening will decrease and the people will go to trismus so this is how the progression of the submucous fibrosis takes place and what is more important is that submucous fibrosis is also a preliminary condition and the the transformation rates vary up to 7.6% so it's still less but it's still there so and the more of the less important is that it is found only in people who are in indian subcontinent and those people who are actually taking betel nut or uh, there is some trauma then you have uh, oral lichen planus so again it is uh, again very dreaded kind of lesion but uh, fortunately uh, studies have shown that uh, lichen planus uh, the malignant transformation is uh, almost uh, less than one of one person but you have six types you have your reticular plaque and plaque types so which are less severe and then you have bullous erosive type which are more severe so when you have these types you know that it is it might uh, turn out to something malignant and you have to take care so what is the differentiating factor between lichen planus and erythroplakia or leukoplakia as i mentioned leukoplakia and erythroplakia are mostly uh, solitary and unilateral while is like you know it is always always bilateral you will get diffuse kind of lesion it will there will be symptoms from the initiating you know, from the beginning as compared to leukoplakia and erythroplakia where you don't get symptoms in lichen planus there will be symptoms from the beginning itself and you'll find this fine reticular striation which will see on the mucosa of buccal mucosa or you can see the tongue or palate or anywhere else in the oral cavity so again as i told you the malignant transformation is very less 
but still if you have bullous and erosive form then you know uh, it can cause it can, can turn out to be malignant in the future and then you have this parietal lesions in reverse smokers so this is generally found in the coastal areas of india generally in andhra pradesh or some where they have a, a you know habit of taking placing the uh, cigar or be or bidi you know reverse pattern and the smoking part is inside and the non smoking part is outside so you'll get these kind of lesion so the first lesion, first picture it's basically nothing but inflammation of the minor salivary gland but the last picture the red picture you see that is something dangerous which you should take care of so what are the oral other uh, suspicious uh, lesion sorry uh, so sorry uh, give us give us some, some time um I'm really sorry for the delay. Now it down the feed, the slide share is working. <laughs> Unfortunately, it did not work in the beginning. Now it's it's kind of working. So Please excuse me for this. Uh, I'm coming back to the slide. Yeah. So, uh, so what are the other uh, suspicious oral lesions? So, first, this is very common to get a fictional keratosis or tobacco pouch keratosis. So, this is nothing but uh, you know chronic irritation causes some hyperkeratination in the oral mucosa, which is because of the snuff they place in the oral cavity. or uh, the beetle they place in the oral cavity beetle nut or whatever and this causes this hyperkeratosis this is which is basically nothing but a hyperkeratosis and this is nothing uh, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, oral cancer but dr partha i think your screen is not seen oh i'm so sorry share I'm really sorry for this. is it visible now yeah so i was talking about fictional keratosis which is nothing but because of the placement of uh, snuff or uh, tobacco inside the oral mucosa and which causes this hyperkeratosis and this is just a hyperkeratosis is not leukoplakia again we have this candidiasis where you have you'll find this white kind of uh, spotting and underneath there will be erythematous mucosa and when you rub it off this white thing will go off unlike in leukoplakia where the white thing does not go off and the, the mucosa will be extremely extremely sensitive and be very very painful unlike as leukoplakia this 
traumatic also. On a first go, it looked like a very dangerous kind of a lesion. But when you look around, you'll find some of the other a sharp tooth or a sharp denture or anything which is causing a chronic trauma and which, which causes this kind of lesion. Once that uh, traumatic factor has been taken care of and the lesion will subside. So that has to be taken into consideration again. Uh, uh, this is just to show uh, two pictures. Uh, one was a lesion in the both the region, the right tongue. The first picture uh, where we thought that uh, it is uh, nothing, but it turned out to be cancer. We had to cut the half of a tongue. But the second picture was just because of the lingually placed premolar. And once the premolar was taken out, the lesion healed. Then you also have some dermatological uh, lesions, Steven Johnson syndrome, pemphigus, and whatnot. And so where, again, you'll find diffuse kind of lesion. There will be mucositis, there'll be atrophy, and people or the patient will be having extreme symptoms, extreme burning sensation, and they will diffuse kind of lesion. And you'll again, if you if you look for anything else in the, in the, in the body, you'll find some other skin lesion too. So, so those things also have in consideration when you're uh, looking for diagnosing an oral cancer, because the treatment would be completely different. Then you have this aptus ulcer, uh, and this aptus ulcer, again, very symptomatic. And they are present only for a shorter duration of time, maybe a week or 10 days or so. And you will always get this aptus ulcer on a non keratinized mucosa, as you can see in the picture. Uh, then you come to herpes. Again, herpes is extremely symptomatic uh, lesions. But as uh, compared to the aptus ulcer, this herpes is always, always present on a keratinized mucosa, as you can see in the palate, in the mammalian border, and the attached gingiva. So that is a differentiating factor between herpes and the uh, your aptus ulcer, because the treatment would be completely different. So uh, now coming to diagnosis, uh, like you have uh, come to a clinical diagnosis, but you have to have a proper diagnosis. So there are various methods where you can actually uh, do diagnosis. And now we have brush cytology or oral CBX or toledin blue or well scope. But uh, all the studies, they have shown that when it comes to uh, this toledin blue or well scope or any cumulus systems, so they have shown that the high chance of false positive very high, and uh, they are still uh, clinical adjuncts. They are not a diagnostic uh, tool. They are just a clinical adjunct. And when it comes to breast cytology, uh, you no know, accurate result. sometimes fail to deliver. So uh, standards always remains biopsy, which is a tissue biopsy. You take a part of tissue and send it for histopathological examination. Again, in biopsy, you have uh, several kinds of biopsy. You have knife biopsy, you have punch biopsy. So again, knife biopsy is generally considered an incisional biopsy with a, with a knife. You go deep, you take the tissue from up to the base so that you get the epithelium, sub-epithelium, so that because if it's a cancer, there has to be epithelial breach. There has to be the breach in the basement membrane so that it has to be termed as an oral cancer. Or you have to have sufficient tissue so that people will get, the pathologist will get dysplastic cells. So a knife biopsy is always considered very safe and an accurate method of diagnosing uh, oral cancer, oral potentially malignant disorders. So now coming to treatment basic, you know, uh, what are treatment basic uh, when it comes to oral potentially immune disorders? So first and foremost, nothing comes before that is habit cessation. Whatever the patient is having habit, you first ask the patient to stop all the habit. Until unless the patient stops that, nothing is going to help. Then you have to look for any etiological factors as such, whether local etiological factor, any, any sharp tooth or denture, anything else, you have to take care of that. Oral hygiene, and lastly, but not the least, you know, proper counseling of the patient. That is very, very important. So when it comes to treatment categories, so we have three major categories. One is close observation, then you have surgical ablation, and then uh, medical treatment, as some would say. Uh, so what are the what are the lesions where actually you want to have close observation? So very thin homogeneous leukoplakia. Uh, in a, a non-risk factor patient like, you know, in buccal mucosa or also if the leukoplakia is present in a non-smoker, it's basically very high risk. If it is present in smokers, you know what is the cause of the leukoplakia. Ask the patient to stop smoking 
and you can always follow the patient. Gingivitis, lichen planus, uh, candidiasis, traumatic ulcers, all these you can follow up. You can follow up at the outset. Then medical treatment. So it's a very controversial topic and I have seen a lot of, lot of uh, physicians, doctors, they prescribe a lot of medicines when, it, when there's leukoplakia, erythroplakia, any, any kind of uh, oral uh, uh, pre-malignant or potentially malignant disorders. But uh, until now, there is not much evidence in the literature to support uh, generalized or chronic use or, uh, you know, uh, solid use of this medical treatment whatsoever. We have a plethora of uh, medical uh, treatment like retinic acid. So, uh, you know, we have allotinib, we have uh, uh, green tea extract and whatnot, but all of them have shown to be not too much effective in either regression of the disease or uh, stopping the disease. So as of date, there is not much evidence to support the use of antioxidant to stop or stop the regression of uh, this potentially big. and very controversial topic steroids. Uh, it's it's a very very you know highly widespreadly used drug when it comes to any kind of oral lesion. So I have seen a lot of uh, patient coming to us with the cancer when they are prescribed steroids for like uh, erythroplakia for leukoplakia. But steroids has no role as such in leukoplakia or erythroplakia. In cy in submucous fibrosis though it I have to point and see this uh, uh, literature by Dr. Borley and many others. They have shown that uh, what previously thought to be a very good uh, treatment for submucous fibrosis, which is uh, interlational injection of steroid, it's actually a detrimental treatment. Just think, because what we are causing by in giving injection, a submucous fibrosis patient has fibrosis underneath the mucosa. And by injection also, uh, when it heals, it, caused, it heals by fibrosis. So it always, always causes rebound fibrosis, which leads to more and more trismus fibrosis. So people will initially might get result, but gradually further the patient will come back to that, you know, my mouth has further reduced. So what is the course of action? Again, he will go for injection. Again, the same thing will happen. So it is, the study has shown that it's detrimental to give intralational injection. It is a wrong treatment. Uh, for submucous fibrosis, the only treatment remains habit cessation and jaw opening exercises. That is the only treatment because once the patient has developed Christmas, it is basically irreversible. So uh, that is the case when it comes to submucous fibrosis. And the role of steroids only remains in immunological or immune moderate condition like uh, lichen planus or dermatological condition. There you can actually prescribe uh, steroids, oral steroids or topical steroids, but erythroplakia, leukoplakia, submucous of uh, uh, fibrosis, you still have rights, but no intralational and no oral steroids. And it comes to surgical ablation, uh, well, again, non-homogeneous leukoplakia, erythroplakia, varicose leukoplakia, in the speckled uh, erythroplakia or leukoplakia, or when you have lesion in the high uh, risk areas, ventral surface of tongue, floor of the mouth, and then you should go for surgical excision. And the vision laser is very large. You should actually go for surgical excision or it's called excisional biopsy. And there are some lesion like this where we don't have any answers. We call it field cancerization because it's so widespread that uh, we still have no answer for this, how to go about this. We can get a diagnosis, but as far as treatment in concern, we don't know because the whole aerodigestive tract is condemned. The whole mucosa from oral cavity to the GI tract becomes condemned. Tobacco or anything else. So we still have no answer for this. So uh, I would say that uh, in the end, the early you see a cancer, early you treat it right, shall make a man healthy, wealthy, and live without fright. And so let's do our duty. and i hope feeling sleepy i'm really sorry if i made you feeling sleepy and uh, thank you so much thank you so much and thank you all for your
listening and thank you bhuya sir thank you deepika dikka ma'am chandana ma'am and lima ba thank, thank you, you dr parsa for this very informative session and here is a token of our appreciation and best wishes for your future from our side my pleasure thank so, you so much thank you everyone as we come to the end of today's webinar i request our organizing secretary dr chandana kolita to deliver the vote of thanks so now we have come to the end of our session so i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion first and foremost i extend our deep sense of appreciation and gratitude to dr dipika dekka vc srimanta sankardeva university of health science for granting us permission to organize the first dental webinar under the university we thank you ma'am for your encouragement and support to the dental fraternity a heartfelt thank to our chief guest dr v r bhuya sir for gracing the occasion thank you sir we are very much indebted to our distinguished speaker dr mahesh varma sir for taking out from his busy schedule and enlighten us with his knowledge we are fortunate to have among us one of our renowned personalities from the field of orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics dr op karbanda sir thank you very much sir for your valuable time my heartfelt thanks to our dynamic dr gopi krishna and our very own dr patrasarathi sakrabarti for delivering excellent presentation and making the webinar such interesting and meaningful in such a short span of time i applaud all the speakers for enlightening us with the most relevant dental topics in their respective field my sincere thanks to dr ac bhuya sir for his untiring efforts and guidance in organizing this webinar thank you sir i would like to specially thank dr sujit bardhan deputy registrar srimanta sankardev university of health science our organizing team member and my colleague dr mitali dr lima dr ruby dr dilip goswami dr subhas devnat dr jogesh sir Uh, our students and technical team of of Srimanta Sankardev University of Health Science who have made this webinar a successful one and la at the last but not the least my sincere thanks to all the wonderful participant nation wide who have turned up in such a great number thank you once again stay safe joy hind lastly i would like to request all the participant to fill the feedback form which is in the chat box uh, so that we can uh, get your email and then we get uh, give the attendance certificate via email so thank you madam thank you all thank you madam and now bhalo the day good the participation was excellent okay thank you madam congratulations everybody thank you madam thank you thank you